I'd like to call the October 21st, 2014 meeting of the Planning Board to order. The Board will be considering tonight's agenda in the following order. Number one, approval of the minutes from August 19th. Number two, the Town Planner's Report. Number three, Old Sea Point Road Subdivision Amendment. Number four, Rudy's Site Plan Amendment. Number five, public comment on items not on tonight's agenda. And number six, adjournment. So first item, approval of the minutes. This is from August 19th. Anyone on the board have any comments, questions in regards to those minutes? No? Then do I hear a motion from anyone? Okay, Liza? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes. Thank you. A second? Um, Pete? Yep, I saw you over there. Okay. Any discussion on the minutes? Okay. Um, seeing none, all those in favor? Okay, and that is unanimous, and there are six of us here tonight. Okay. Second item is the town planner's report. I don't have much to report. Uh, I did want to let everyone know that the town council held a public hearing on the town center plan that uh, Peter Curry represented the planning board in that committee. And that was held at the beginning of this month. The town center plan was approved by the council, unanimous vote. And then uh, they also held a public hearing on a TIF application for the town center. And that was also approved by unanimous vote. So that will probably be submitted by the end of the month. And that really sets the town up for basically starting to save more money for infrastructure improvements, specifically sidewalk and stormwater. Thank you. Okay. Third item on, on tonight's agenda is Old Sea Point Road Subdivision Amendment. Elaine Zavania Soquis is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Old Sea Point Road Subdivision to reconfigure the lot line for Lot 5. Both application completeness, uh, we'll hear completeness in a public hearing tonight, the plan will be reviewed under Section 16-2-3 of Subdivision Ordinance, and this will, item will be addressed in the following format. Town Planner will provide an overview of the item, after which the applicant will summarize any changes made to the plan. The public is then welcome to comment on completeness of the project, after which the Board will determine completeness. If the application is deemed complete, then the public is welcome to come back and comment on the project. After the public hearing, the board may begin discussion, concluding with a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, do you have an overview for us? Yes. Um, old Sea Point Road is an old subdivision that dates back to the early 1990s when it was really a two-lot subdivision. It has, over time, one of the lots has divided over time into three lots, and this lot right here is the other lot divided into two lots. We're now at a five lot subdivision and this has happened over a series of years, each time with a subdivision amendment. The last time the planning board approved the amendment, there were a series of improvements to Old Sea Point Road that required those improvements have been completed. And tonight, the applicant is not asking to add a new lot. Instead, they're asking to um, reconfigure lot five and then the land outside of what is being reconfigured will be conveyed to an abutting lot, and then both of those lots will be conveyed to another abutter. So because the, uh, the land that is left over after lot five is going to be conveyed to an abutter, it qualifies for one of the exemptions under the state subdivision law, so it's not considered an additional lot. Any questions? Okay. Thank you. And with that, I'm Bob Metcalf with Metro Associates, and I'm going to have to pick Maureen's brain here a little bit because we seem to have some little technical difficulty. The PowerPoint showing on the screen here, but not showing up there. Before I mess around with your computer.
Got one more trick and then we're out of luck. <laughs> <laughs> one time I don't bring a paper plan, right? You can use my plan. Yeah, but if, if this should show up from there. Okay. See, there's one. Okay. Let's see, the number of this is the Give you my. I'm sorry about that. Okay. Give you my plan. Technical difficulties. I'm going to have to use a paper plan.
So, my apologies. This computer is a floating computer in our office. It was used in another meeting. Apparently, something was reset. <laughs> and not set right. <laughs> All right. No uh, playing nice. Again, for the record, I'm Bob Metcalf with Metro Associates, representing the Lanes of Odney Silkwest. Uh, and as Maureen had outlined, what we're back for is to amend the old Sea Point Road subdivision, which was previously amended by the board back in 2012, uh, to create a 2.35 acre parcel around uh, Elaine's prior home, uh, and then retain the balance of the property, which was uh, 6.45 acres. Uh, board was uh, that we came and met with the board at the workshop to go through what the the presentation was going to be in terms of creating basically shrinking lot five uh, as part of the subdivision and then conveying the balance of the parcel out to an abutter in this case it's elaine and her husband elaine owns this parcel completely unto herself and then it would be a transfer route and then with the ability to, to outsail that parcel both parcels together to another abutter who's interested in acquiring the property. Uh, what we've done is uh, this is the reconfiguration for what lot five would be. Access would be off of old C point here. Uh, the property would be served by underground utilities. It will be an on-site waste disposal system here, and then we're going to be servicing by a private well. Uh, when this subdivision was done back in the 90s, the original developer, who, as I understand, went belly up and then two lots were created, private water lines were running along this side of old Sea Point Road, the one to serve Elaine's former home, and then the mills property over here. Since that time, the water district had changed all its regulations and requires that if you don't front directly on a public water source, you have to have a minimum of 15 feet of road frontage. The only road frontage for public water source is on Old, old Ocean House, and the, she does not have frontage on Old Ocean House. The only other option would be to extend the public water main up Old Sea Point to serve one lot, and the water district would give them preliminary budget numbers of $150,000 to install a four inch water main, which is the minimum size they'd have to install just to serve that one lot. And that didn't include any ledge removal, that was just looking at a, a standard installation. Uh, so. We're requesting that this project, property be served by an on-site well. We've provided documentation from a well driller in regards to the ability to provide adequate water source as well as meeting the water quality provisions that the ordinance requires. Uh, let's see. The remaining parcel that we were talking about, PowerPoint would have probably highlighted this a little bit better, is this section of land right in here which is 4.6092 acres. And that is the parcel that will be conveyed to the parcel that's jointly owned right now by Elaine and her husband. So this parcel unto itself, this is an equal of 10, 10 acres of land that uh, is total. Uh, Elaine's attorney and the town attorney, John Wall, had been going back and forth, and Maureen has a diatribe of the emails that kept going back and forth in terms of coming up with how this met the requirements as far as state statute and that this conveyance would remove this parcel from the subdivision regs. And uh, it requested notes be added to the deeds that would be conveying the property, as well as adding a note to the subdivision plan. And that note has been added to the plan and is also included in copies of the deeds that we had submitted to the town. And I believe the board has copies of those uh, for that particular conveyance. The Prior subdivision approval had seven conditions of approval. That is the 2012. Of the seven, six were completed. They've been satisfied. The one that was still on that plan that was not addressed uh, is the one that we talked to the board about during the workshop, which was the condition to provide a 50-foot wide right-of-way that would connect Old Sea Point and ultimately be able to come back down to Old Ocean House. We presented to the board that in order to try and put a town road, a road meeting town standards, it would be basically creating a canyon that would run through here. And as Steve Harding, when I met with him to go over the plan, basically said it would look like an interstate off ramp canyon going through here. So uh, it would have significant impact since the land is now being conveyed out to be joined with this parcel. 
there is no connectivity in terms of being a future development. So we're asking that condition to be eliminated and the subdivision plan actually has reflected that that note has been, that condition has been removed from the subdivision plan that you folks have in front of you. Um, those are really the overviews of what uh, the applicant is seeking and uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you Bob. All right. Um, at this point, we are going to, uh, we need to decide is, do we have enough information before us? Is this a complete application? And um, I do want to say that anyone from the public can now get up and speak at the podium on whether or not this application is deemed complete. Would anyone want to talk about completeness of this application? Seeing no one, I will close that and I will ask the board, <clears throat> do you find that this is complete or? I have a question for Maureen. Um, one of the letters that we received was from someone in the subdivision who indicated that there were covenants in place that uh, this proposed plan would not comply with. Does the town have interest in whether those covenants are adhered to or does the town only care that its own ordinance is followed in this case? No, we don't. The short answer is no. The longer answer is, you know, a private property owner can impose covenants on a property and in a subdivision review, the planning board typically is not interested in covenants or only interested in the ones that also relate to standards of review. So you might put something in a covenant that requires that a road be maintained and the planning board might care about that because they also have a standard about road maintenance. But other than that, it's the covenants that are being mentioned, as far as I know, because I have no copy of them because they were not part of the planning board approval, they're, they're private covenants. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was going to bring that up later, so thank you very much, Joe, for bringing that to our attention. All right, any other questions regarding completeness? Ben, would anyone like to make a motion on completeness? Sure. Thank you. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Elaine Savordney, sorry Elaine, <laughs> for an amendment to the um, previously approved Old Sea Point Road subdivision to reconfigure the lot line for lot five be deemed complete. Thank you, do I hear a second? Second. Thank you, Elaine. Any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Did you get the names on that? Carolyn Elaine. Okay, thank you. Okay, so the item is deemed complete. All right, and now the public is welcome to come back if they want to actually speak about the project. Does anyone have any questions in regard to this amendment? Seeing no one, then. I will bring it back to the board. Does the board have any questions for the applicant or comments? Yes, Elaine. I just wanted to clarify one of the things you had said about the remaining land being removed from the subdivision. So it is the conclusion of the attorneys is that it is no longer a part of the subdivision once it's conveyed and merges with the other parcel. Is that correct? That's correct. And you said there was a note on the plan to that effect? There's a note that was added to the subdivision plan. We gave Maureen an updated copy of that plan. The plan set that you folks have is the original submission. And we revised the plan. Uh, Could you read that note? Uh, well, as soon as I can find Great, it. Great, thank you. Uh, 
any part thereof transferred within five years of the date of this deed to another person or entity without the 4.6092 parcel, which is this parcel. Said transfer would require subdivision approval from the town of Gateway. Well, that's a different, that's a different note than what you described. My question was... That is, that is... That's the note that was provided to us from John Wall to put on the plan. Okay, my question was whether the remainder of Lot 5 is in or out of this... It's out of the subdivision. Basically what happens is the remaining portion of land, the 4.6092 acres, will be conveyed by Elaine to she and her husband. Right. And that basically creates the two tracks. And the note that John has put on, had us put on the plan, references that if any portion of the currently owned joint parcel is ever conveyed without the entire 4.0692 acre parcel, it then has to come back to the plan, to the town for a subdivision approval. Right, but it seems to me that we also should have a note on this subdivision plan for clarity, if that's the, the legal conclusion that's been made that this remaining land is no longer part of the subdivision and that the remaining land no longer has access to Old Sea Point Road. I see the note here that says that the new lot has, does have access, but there's nothing to say that the remaining land does not have access. And to me, that leaves some ambiguity that I think should be cleared up because I think that's the intention. Uh, can I, Maureen? information on that? What I'm reading is the definition of subdivision in our own ordinance mm -hmm. and under state law communities must use the state subdivision definition so right. we just imported what the state has in their law and, and what they say is if you divide land in three parcels you have to get subdivision review however there are several exceptions and exception six is a division accomplished by the transfer of any interest in land to the owners of land abutting that land does not create a separate lot does, or lots for the purpose of this definition unless the intent of the transfer is to avoid the objectives of the ordinance. The real estate exempt under this paragraph is transferred within five years to another person without all of the merged land, then the previously exempt division creates a lot or lots for the purposes of this ordinance. Right, but so, I'm talking about a slightly different point. Are you just right. maybe but asking? This, this, is, because the, when this the, when is what we're trying to get to, is this right here. Uh, Elena, but you I have a different question. saying that um, you'd like to see some type of a note saying right. that um, this transfer uh, is not part of this subdivision and there's no right to Old Sea Point. I'm not talking about the transfer. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying is this subdivision had original boundaries that included the entirety of Lot 5, which meant that the remaining part of Lot 5 was subject to everything on the subdivision plan. As I understand it, Lot 5 is not only being merged with Elaine and her husband's adjacent land, but it's also, according to the attorneys who have talked, being removed from the subdivision so that that parcel is no longer subject to everything shown on the subdivision plan. So it seems to me, nor, I think the intent is, nor does that remaining land retain any rights to Old Sea Point Road. I think both of those things should be explicitly stated on the plan because otherwise it's not clear that that is the case. I'm following what you're saying here. Anyone have any comment about adding a, a note to the plan or Maureen? Uh, can I, one, that seems to make sense, but the remaining parcel of the old lot five is no longer in any way an entity once the subdivision, once this takes place. But, it, but it, it still has boundaries and it is still shown. The geographic location remains shown on this plan. So it just seems to me an easy point to clarify that makes it absolutely clear if that's what's been concluded that when it comes time to develop this combined parcel and perhaps it's going to be combined with yet another parcel, if I understand what's been said, 
that that future development no longer has to refer to this subdivision plan, nor is there any question that that future development has any rights in Old Sea Point Road. Would it make it clear if there was a third plan that showed a boundary of the entire two lots combined? Could be. I think it's, I think it's something fairly easy. I think the note could simply say, upon conveyance of the remaining 4.6092 acres to the uh, owner of the abutting land, the remaining land is no longer a part of the old Sea Point Road subdivision and the remaining land no longer has any rights to Old Sea Point Road. I think it's a simple note that clarifies what otherwise could be somewhat murky. Peter. Yeah, I, my question may be a follow-on to Elaine's point, which I think is a good one. Are you saying that the, what you've identified here as the remaining land of 4.6 acres will be conveyed to a lot of 52? 15-B, yes. 15-B. Yeah. And those two parcels together will be conveyed to the low uh, properties immediately to the north? Is that that is, that's what's under discussion to do, yes. Okay. So I, I think Elaine's point, and I agree, is that that 4.6 acres, which before this gets approved, had certain rights and Correct. obligations in the subdivision plan, you want to remove that so that doesn't follow and join with the 15B lot and end up in the hands of the uh, low properties to the north. We can create a note and get that the morning in the morning. We have, we do, and I will explain that we do have an issue where time is of essence that uh, this transfer uh, is all to happen tomorrow. So we are looking to obtain approval from the board and have a mylar be able to be signed and then ultimately recorded to the register of deeds prior to a scheduled closing that we were looking at. Yes. My expectation is that the note that needs to be added will be captured in the condition of approval this evening. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. Yeah. And we can have the mylar, as I said, change first thing in the morning. Mm -hmm. Would that be okay with you, Elaine, in a condition of approval? Absolutely, as long as it then gets on to the mylar when it's ready for recording. How, are we planning to sign it tomorrow morning? I'll be sending you an email. <laughs> okay. As soon as it's ready. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions on that? Does anyone have any questions in regards to the, the private well that will be dug instead of the water? Fine. No questions on that? Okay. Any other comments or questions by the board? Yes. Yeah, so I guess the only other comment I want to make it relates to the letter. Joe mentioned it briefly, but I, I just wanted to say that there are private covenants here and that's not within our jurisdiction to either impose them or not. They go beyond the standards of our subdivision ordinance. And so we appreciate the concern and the seeming unfairness, but it's really not within our purview to do anything about it. That's correct. Um, I know you said that you've already looked at, um, you made some changes to the plat. Uh, then is the numbering now correct? You had two number nines. Did you? Two number nines? Is it still, it, just go through the numbers. One, two, three, one. I'm assuming somebody picked it up probably, but. Remember those, yeah. That's all I had to add. Okay, well, I think we're at the point then. If anyone would uh, like to make a motion for the board to consider. I will. Thank you, Elaine. Seeing, yes, have you done word smithing? Sort of. Okay, findings of fact. 
Elaine Zavodny Showquist is requesting an amendment to the previously approved Old Seapoint Road subdivision to reconfigure the lot lines for lot 5, which requires review under section 1625 amendments to previously approved subdivisions. The applicant will be deeding land outside lot 5 to the abutter, resulting in no new subdivision lot. The applicant has substantially addressed the standards of the subdivision ordinance, section 1631. Therefore, be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and the facts presented, the application of Elaine Zavodny Showquist for the amendment to the previously approved Old Seapoint Road subdivision to reconfigure the lot lines for lot five be approved subject to the following conditions. We are. That, a, that, that a note be added to the plan that the land remaining outside lot five will be deeded to the abutter and that such land will be re removed from Old Seapoint Road subdivision and will no longer have access to Old Seapoint Road. Um, and another thing that I'm just seeing here is that the lot being created within the subdivision be labeled as lot five on the subdivision plan. Side note, I'm adding that because I don't see anything here that calls the new property lot five, yet apparently that's the intent. It seems to me to be lot 18-4. The numbering on that was based on the current tax assessor's records. That's where there's a confusion in terms of how these things are numbered. There's your subdivision numbering, and then there was the town's tax record numbers, and that's where the attorney had us correct the labeling of the lots based on what the current assessors. Uh, there already is a lot five. Then I think we're going to need to change the word in the guess. So any place that we said lot five, should be referred to as reconfigured lot 18-4 because the reference in, in these, okay. this wording to lot 5 doesn't relate to anything that you see on the plan. Okay, and um, do we need to put an amendment or condition about renumbering the plat? No. No, that's okay. Okay, just gonna fix it. Anyone um, like to uh, second oh, that motion? Second. Thank you. Okay. Any discussion on the motion? All right, then. All those in favor? That's unanimous. Okay. The motion is passed. Thank you.
Okay, the next item on the agenda is Rudy's Site Plan and Resource Protection Permit. 517 Ocean House LLC is requesting amendments to the previously approved site plan and resource protection permit for exterior siding, lighting, curbing, water lines, generator, and planters. The application will be reviewed for compliance with sections 19-9, site plan regulations, and section 19-8-3, wetland regulations. Item will be addressed in the following format. Town Planner will provide a summary of the project, after which the applicant will summarize the proposed changes to the site plan. The public is then welcome to comment on completeness of the project, after which the board will determine completeness. If the application is deemed complete, then the public is welcome to comment on the project. After public comment, the board may begin discussion, including a decision on whether a site walk and or a public hearing should be scheduled. And this will conclude with a motion for the board to consider. Maureen, you have a summary for us. So for tonight, uh, the planning board approved the Rudy site plan in December of 2011. There have been two amendments after that approval. Those amendments did not address siding. They addressed other items. Um, for tonight's meeting, the applicant has elected to come to the board because a letter's been, a decision's been made by the code enforcement officer that the uh, exterior siding on the first floor does not match uh, the siding that the planning board approved in December of 2011. So the applicant has combined that request with requests for other amendments, which are very typical during a project when people make adjustments to the site. Um, the other amendments, for the most part, uh, relate to installation of a generator, um, conversion of lighting to an LED system, uh, addition, uh, replacement of an asphalt curb with a concrete extruded curb, which has been previously approved by the town and is currently at the sea salt market site. Uh, and there's a few other, uh, there's the water lines, there's a few items. Uh, I'm going to leave it at that. Okay, thank you very much. Would the applicant would like to make a presentation. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm Peggy McGeehy with the law firm of Perkins Thompson. And I'm here on behalf of the applicant, uh, 517 Ocean House. Uh, with us this evening uh, is Paul Woods of 517 Ocean House. And the um, uh, engineer, uh, Pat Carroll of Carroll Associates, and the architect, Phil Kaplan. Is it Kaplan Associates? Kaplan Thompson Architecture. Phil Kaplan Thompson Architecture. Um, I'm going to make a, a couple of comments about procedural due process. And then we do hope to have a good meeting tonight. And uh, what we'll have is, a, uh, I think it'll be a total of about 15 minutes. Pat Carroll has a presentation about all of the points except for the siding. And then I will come back for a few minutes about the siding. And then Phil's going to come back and with uh, the siding as well. Um, we are hoping to be giving you uh, the benefit of uh, being projected on the wall. Uh, apparently, that may not happen this evening. That's fine, I think, with what I have to, to present. I don't need your, the PowerPoint. It's mostly text. Uh, it should be OK with Pat. Uh, we may, though, have to distribute photographs to you, which is we have one or two copies, and we may have to go back and forth. So we'll all figure it out together. So here's the procedural issue. Um, we've got a concern that uh, one or more of the board members is doing um, some online factual research um, on this application. Uh, for example, the town planner forwarded uh, to our engineer an email request from one of the board members asking that we submit information similar to uh, information that that board member had found online. And you're not supposed to do that. Uh, we've also got a concern about a board member making an uh, unscheduled, unannounced uh, site visit. Uh, we also have a concern that, that, um, uh, about some bias. There was some, some aggressive questioning. I wasn't there. But I, I heard about this aggressive questioning at the workshop and uh, by w one or two members, and one of them um, had earlier in the context of some property litigation several years ago, uh, had a personal confrontation with the uh, owner of the applicant uh, while on the owner's property. So we've got all these concerns. And we're not going to ask you tonight for confirmation or denial or recusal about any of these concerns, because we do hope to have a good meeting. But what we're going to ask for going forward 
is for the board to review and comment on this application based on the public record only. And not on any board member's personal research that's not in the record. And to provide an open, not an anonymous, and impartial, and biased, and civil review. And we also ask that at any future visit, we're happy to have the board visit, very proud of this project, um, be appropriately noticed and scheduled so that everyone, including the applicant and the public, uh, can attend. Uh, now, you may know, and I'm just going to read a bit to you, um, that they're entitled to this. It's a procedural due process issue. The Mutton Hill case, Superior Court cases, they talk about the importance. I mean, you are judges. You're an adjudicatory board. And judges don't go out and get their own evidence. And they don't make on site visits. Uh, you, they follow the procedure. And you have a handbook from the Maine Municipal Association that gives you guidance on that. And I'm just going to take 30 seconds and read to you from that. As to a site visit, it says, Municipal attorneys advise municipal boards that the site visits conducted by less than a majority of the board should never occur and insist that the board only conduct site visits as a public meeting of a majority of the board. If a majority of the board is going to visit the site of a proposed project, the board should be aware that such on-site meetings are meetings which should be preceded by public notice and at which the public has a right to be present under the Freedom of Information Act. And as to online research, personal research, the Maine Municipal Association advises uh, planning boards. Sometimes board members want to collect information to help the board make its decision rather than on relying on information presented by the applicant or other parties. Such a practice could be viewed as evidence of bias on the part of that board member, so probably should be avoided except we're publicly authorized by a vote of the board. If a board member does engage in such conduct, he or she should be sure that it's done in an objective way and any information collected, um, including this email from an anonymous board member today about court inciting, um, be entered into the board record. This is an inaccurate, uh, this is an inaccurate uh, uh, aging of a court inciting. And yet, it is something that may be in that board member's mind and will be considered, and we wouldn't have an opportunity to respond. So thank you for providing us this evening that kind of uh, fair, impartial, civil, open, uh, and appropriate you. What review. What did you say about, yeah, you can make a reference. OK, so, so the first thing is the, that that you held up tonight I'm sorry? That little email you just held up inaccurate. I think we're having trouble hearing. I know I'm okay. having trouble. Yep. It looks like Peggy well, the email that held up tonight, yes. Right. That, I want to be clear that that was a request by a board member for additional information, which I provided to the applicant prior to the meeting. That in request was circulated to the applicant. It was circulated to every member of the board. And it currently, it will reside in the public file. Okay. So be, I, I am unclear right. why that would be an inappropriate action for a board member okay. through staff sure. to, add, to, to alert the applicant right. that this is a question that will be asked. Right. So and I'm going to, thank you, thank you I, I for letting clear that up for I'm going to be, you know, I'm a little concerned with right. the procedural we, concerns you have And we want to be sure procedure raised. is done appropriately because, going forward. So you know, let me answer I'm your, not aware of any Let me meeting. answer your question, Maureen. Yeah. Okay. Um, this um, email that was forwarded, it does not indicate it's from a board member. It says, Maureen, could you suggest to the applicant they include an image that shows how court and weathers over time? I found this. So that indicates that somebody did online research. It was forwarded with and no identification as to who sent the email. And then we were asked to look at this. Um, our architect said that doesn't accurately reflect what happens in here. Right. And, so and it, if I may answer your but question. But it doesn't say that that accurately reflects what is but happening it does show on the that property there has of the been, applicant. It does it's an show. example of what the planning board member asked for information, which is could right. you provide information on how the product that you are using on your right. site will age over time? So what um, 
we, this didn't indicate it was from a board member, and thank you for this evening confirming that this did come from, as you put it, an anonymous board member. So we now know okay. it came First from a board of all, member. It came from me, and okay. Maureen yeah. is exactly right. What I had intended was that the architect provide additional information about how the material weathers. Right. Quite simple. I mean, well, it's, if anything, it may actually more well, and and we, we hope to do that. What, what we found was that at the workshop, there was a lot of online research done by the board, but that was before the application was filed. No, 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 no foul there. But once the application is pending, what we have now, it's so easy to do, is board members go online and they're doing research. And I believe that there's probably other things that board members have been reviewing online. We just happen to have this one from, from you. And, and so what I'm saying is that the Maine Municipal Association advises you, don't do it. Judges don't go and do online research to get facts related to a case, and neither should board members, unless you do it openly and you have a vote and the rest of that. So we did receive this this afternoon. We uh, will be, are prepared, as Pat advised uh, the planner, uh, to address this. Thank you very much. I do agree with you. It's a point. But it does show that there's a lot of online research being done that's outside the record. I have no idea what else people have been looking at. Can you explain the vote? What is this vote? Vote. That you referred to. Pardon? Can you hear me okay? I'm not, not sure very well. It. Okay. Can you please explain the voting? That the voting? The vote? The voting? V-O-T-E, yeah, that occurs, it, that you mentioned? I don't, didn't mention any voting. I, can. I, you I believe that the right. research should only be done pursuant to a vote of the board. Did I, I say vote? I, and I'm sorry, I misspoke. Can you I read that to us again? Can you read to us that what, you read to Oh, you want me to read? Okay, yes. Just about what the, the process vote. is, Just and that's what the, the research, vote. it says, if a board member does engage in such conduct, he or she should be sure it is done in an objective way and that any information collected is entered into the board's record. Because if you find things and you're uh, looking at... Can you mention about the vote, please? This, the vote. You mentioned the board should vote to authorize online... That was the site plan. That was the site plan. Can you read it to us, please? Sure. Um, it says, municipal attorneys advise municipal boards that site visits conducted by less than a majority of the board should never occur. And we do know that a site visit occurred yesterday. And insist that the board only conduct site visits as a public meeting of a majority of the board. If a majority of the board is going to visit the site, and we welcome you to do that, the board should be aware that such on-site meetings are meetings that, which must be preceded by public notice at which the public has a right to be present. Unfortunately, I don't can, see it. Can you mention the the paragraph, the sentence. That's on page in which 16. Vote, in which the word vote. It's on page 16 vote. of yes. chapter 2 of the handbook called Decision Making Process. Okay. Can you read that again about the vote? I want to clarify that. All right. Well, there, I didn't say anything about the vote there. I heard it. Did anyone else yes, hear the I word heard. vote? Can you please read about the vote? Ah, I find vote, but that has to do with the, okay. So let's Thank go with you. the uh, online piece. Such a pro practice could be viewed as evidence of bias on the part of the board member, so probably should be avo avoided except where publicly authorized by a vote of the board. So okay, if the board you. wishes to do its own research outside the public record, then you should vote on it first. Thank you. Okay. Okay. Uh, yes, Peter. Uh, yes, I, I do have a question. This, this online research point, I think, is... You may have said more than you meant to. Um, I was in going over your own submission, submission of the applicant, and I believe some uh, by you. There were ample references to websites where the uh, virtues of the court were talked about at length, which is fine. Uh, so you, I believe, you may have just opened the door to the, no. to the internet, and absolutely no problem right. myself. Right doing further research because, ah. quite frankly, there was no, if I'm limited to your sources, right. which are generally vendors of Cortland, right. it was a pretty nice story, but right. it, it was, I think you would agree it was not balanced. 
But uh, that is the way it's always in a courtroom and before an adjudicatory well, board. There are two parties in a court, so we, you have an advocate for the other side. I understand. It's your town planner who do the research. I, I take your point, but I think you opened the door to the internet right. and this product. Right. And I don't personally feel remiss okay. in looking a little bit further right. to see and what I, else is out there. Right. And I think this is all an interesting conversation. It's an evolving thing. But when we give you a website reference, that's to provide just like a case reference is to provide you the authority and it's appropriate absolutely we've invited for you to review that website but then if you are going on to other websites we don't know about it you may be considering matters we have no idea about which is evidenced by this I'll tell you about it tonight no problem okay uh, yes I, Maureen and I'd, then I'm gonna hear I'd, from I'd like to make a point that I have not received any information from any board member that is being used before this project has been submitted. And if any board member does do research, I would ask them to provi please provide me with a copy and I will make sure it is circulated to every member of the board. I will provide a copy to the applicant and it will also go in the public file. And since this hasn't been a formally submitted application yet, I believe that this request is still very timely and consistent with the concerns raised by this applicant. I would ask if any board members have any concerns with that request in terms of doing research on the internet. Elaine? I think the implication has been made here that there has in fact been bias in this case. Um, I think that implication is incorrect and unsupported. Um, I think the point of what you read are not legal requirements, they're suggestions from the Maine Municipal Association. I think the underlying intent is that everything considered by the board be done publicly, that all information be discussed publicly, that anything observed by anyone about the site be discussed publicly if it factors into a decision. I think we do that and have always done that. When one person looks at a site, I do that every day when I drive by this particular site. I'm by myself, I am not a meeting, I am an individual. So I disagree with your statement that an individual going to a site is a meeting of less than a majority. It is not a meeting, it is an individual. Correct. And I think if an individual goes to the site and makes an observation, as long as that observation is shared at a public meeting, I think there is nothing inappropriate. And so I would state emphatically that we have not done anything inappropriate, um, and I think the, the implication in your comments is inaccurate. Okay. And I will provide a little more information, which is the board member who came there didn't just drive by, but went through the chain link fence onto the property and almost ran into my client. That's so. trespassing. <laughs> so, that's anyway, trespassing. I will that's say a different thing. we had this happen with the Land Use Regulation Commission. There was a member of the commissioner who went to our property. The assistant attorney general called me, said it shouldn't have happened. Uh, it's supposed to be done through public notice. Did we want the person to be recused? We said no, but we appreciated being notified of it. And um, I, I, um, with all due respect, I do think that it is not. Uh, it is not uh, supposed to happen where you have individual board members going through the chain link fence and because we have no idea what they're seeing and what they're making decisions, resting their decisions on. The same thing as to online research about things that may be seen, not shared. We have no idea. We don't have an opportunity to respond. That may be your opinion. I don't believe it is think it's the law. law as long as all that information comes here, if that's, if that's the case, that individuals are not allowed to look at properties, then that is that's certainly right. not what we have been uh, And if I may, Justice Fritchie made a decision about this, and one of the uh, three things that he considered in overturning a planning board decision is that a board member made a site visit without letting anyone know. Well, the question is, did the board member then bring right. those observations gonna, to the board? I, this was me, too. Okay. Um, so what happened? Wait, point made. <laughs> I, Pulled out of Broad Cove Road and pulled over to deal with my cell phone. Paul was across the street. He actually invited me in. It wasn't you. And I said, Board member, it was not you. Oh, okay. No, you didn't run into him. <laughs> and, but I did say, I can't talk about it. Correct, and that's the risk also, is to have ex party communication. So um, it's. 
we do expect to have a good meeting tonight. We did do our best to make a presentation. I'm sorry to have kind of started this off on a sour note, but the intent was so that we kind of just get it right going forward. So at this point, um, are we going to take a public vote that anything that we've looked online is we all, I mean, what is that guideline? Yeah, well, Brian, let me ask you, I, you know, Googled it and I probably looked 50, just very casually skimmed through a whole bunch of sites just to see what information I have. Do you want me to send a, the, the link to each and every site that I looked at? how much or little I look at? I, I, I find I, this astonishing. I would, I would prefer not to give you the wrong answer. Right. So what I would like to do is to take this question back to our town attorney and get you some advice. Yes. And, in, in from, and, and you have not done anything formal with this application yet. So I would ask from this night forward until I can get you some information if you look at a site, if you can provide me with either the, the website address or copies of what you look at, if you just email that to me, then I can circulate it to the full board, I can circulate it to the applicant, I can add it to the file. How's that? And I will get back to you with anything else I can get in terms of visits to the site and internet access. And um, my question then is, should we not talk about the siding tonight until we hear from our town attorney? Because I believe everyone is probably Googling the uh, siding. Victoria, I just have one comment to make. I came here to be open-minded, to listen to the presentation Thank you. By, the, by the people who are representing Rudy's, and you started it off the wrong way. You really did. It, yes. it really got my back up. I knew. And so it's not making me, my mind's closing. <laughs> yep. So I want to be open-minded. I don't, I didn't go Googling anything. I want to be open-minded. I want to listen to what you all have to say. Yep. And I don't want to parse every single sentence and every single word that somebody has to say and worry about who's offending whom and who's overstepping which bounds. I think we need to just move forward on this and we would have, I think we would have been off to a much better start if we had just started in with the presentation. And I will concede one thing to you. There were some confrontational aspects to the workshop, and I will concede that. Right. And I think we've all moved beyond that. Right. And we would have stayed beyond that had you not started right. out. With and this. I completely, I was exactly, your responses were exactly what I was worried about. I was thinking, I really, should just keep my mouth shut, but then I thought I have no idea how this will continue, and if it because of this, because of that site visit yesterday, and it, and there was no information about it. In other words, we asked the, my client asked the town planner if there was a board member who came on the site and was not given an answer, and then because we had this and it was kept anonymous, and I thought I've got to say something because we want this process going forward to be right, and I'm sorry that it puts people on a defensive. I'd like you to just put it in your back pocket and then listen to Pat and then listen to, to us because I do think you're going to be very proud of this project. As someone said, it's probably your best commercial building that you're going to have in this town. And if you just give us a chance to show you about it, um, let's just do it right. And that's, I'm sorry. I just didn't know how to get around it. I didn't even draft it until after I get this email. So. So at this point, I'm asking the board again, um, until we hear from the town attorney, do we not talk about the siding? If that is what people were looking at, I'm not sure if they're looking at the lights, I'm not sure if they were looking at the generator, I mean, it's probably the siding that we're all looking at online, in public, so what do we do at this point? I think we look at the project. Yeah, That's yeah I agree. Let's, let's hear the story. Do we need to take this vote that anything that we've no. looked online no. is as no. everyone I comfortable saying if, that? If I may, we will I'm going to suggest no harm, no foul. Your point is made. We haven't even decided if it's complete. I just put that in there because this is an evolving concern. I mean, even judges are going to go online. But I put it out there just for going forward. That's what I'm saying, is let's try to do it right going forward. So can we reference? anything that we have a concern about I mean is only if it's on the public record if you have say you know what I did some online research and I see blah 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 I would say unless you 
bring it forward and give us an opportunity to see it and respond, that it would not be appropriate to bring it up. Yes. Okay, so if, if it is... Unless, you, unless it's in the record. It, right, so if it's presented and put into the record, right. it's fine. Right. Uh, right, so we didn't make it up. If we have something in front of us and read from it, and then say, here, right. make a photocopy, you're fine right. with that. Madam Chairman, I think that when you, at the workshop, that you had already done a fair amount of research and you, re you referenced it, there was no application at the time. I think that's fine. But my guess is that it's kind of a slippery slope, and now we're getting to be a, a, a pending application. It's different. Now you're a judge. But so I, that's what I'm saying. The line is clear now going forward. I don't think you want to say, well, I just found out some more evidence of my own. And this but is what I found. But are you saying that if anything that is said tonight about I found this on the internet, right, and pre and is then right. then, then you'll ignore everything I said Maureen. this evening, exactly. Sorry, and then is handed right. off to Maureen. Please stay within the public record. To share with you, right, to make part of the public record to right. put into the file. First, You're put it in the public record. That that is fine. First, put it in the public record and give us an opportunity to see it so we can respond. Yes, that's called there an opportunity will be a to be heard. Hearing. I just want to clarify what you're trying to tell us. Is right. That if I'm trying to say, please be fair, be open, don't be anonymous. Give us an opportunity to see what you're looking at so we can respond. And yes, I, I saw. Well, with all due respect, respect to counsel's request, I'm not too thrilled to be muzzled in what I say tonight if I have a question about the product. Because ask an open ended question. Came from, from something I read, right. I expect to be able to ask the applicant for an answer. Right. Absolutely, if you ask an open-ended question, but if you say, you know, I saw, I was reading something, I've got some, et cetera, and it says, well, we haven't even seen it. So that's kind of the line, I would think, because we do want to have a dialogue. We're very proud of this. We just don't want to be responding to things that we haven't even seen. And you'll have that opportunity because anything that anyone brings up tonight yep. can then be given to staff, and staff can then submit it to you. Let's work this out together. I mean, I think we all want to get to the truth, agreement? but we just want to do it fairly. And are we may we come agreement? up with new law for the May Municipal Association meeting. <laughs> now, are we so. in agreement? I would just want to make sure. Are we in agreement that if anyone brings up something tonight, quotes from something, hands it to staff, staff hands right. the copy right. to you, are we in agreement? No. What, what I would no, say is, what, no. what I understand is, if you're going to quote from something that has not in the record right now, that would be inappropriate. Okay. Ah, okay. Can I speak? Yes. Uh, actually, that's if speaking. we have not seen it, and you, a board member, a, an adjudicatory board member, says, "I found something," and here it is, I consider that a little bit of a blind side. Liza. Oh yeah. Um, I think the issue that we have before us tonight is pretty narrow. It's complete completeness. So um, I think we can go ahead and have a conversation about completeness and table. Um, the research question. And, if, and then we, we can, if I may, Maureen okay. talks to the attorney. Okay. Talk to us. Yeah. And if I may, we were asked to make a presentation. We worked very late last night to do it. And one of the things is, you know, we were we didn't expect to do a presentation. We were told, you know, but but the agenda said there might be uh, that opportunity. And then we were we asked, should we be making a presentation tomorrow? Because we thought it was completeness. Yes, after the completeness, we want you to make a presentation. So we all got busy. I put together a PowerPoint. I want to present it tonight. I mean, we're just getting blindsided. So. so, yes. Typically what you would do is you would look at completeness first. Mm -hmm. And then I have usually encouraged the board, if you deem an application complete, at that same meeting, if you have substantive comments, to provide them to the applicant as soon as possible because it helps the applicant respond, revise plans, they don't have to come back to as many meetings. What I am hearing is that you probably don't want to have a long substantive discussion tonight, that you can act on completeness and that you can then decide whether you want to do additional research with advice from your counsel, and that may mean that if you schedule a public hearing next month, that that will be the first time you have a discussion on substantive issues, and that if the applicant doesn't have answers to your questions, you will just be tabling it after the public hearing. 
And what we would ask is that we get a chance to make the presentation, because I think that may bring to mind questions so that the public hearing can be as productive a hearing as we can make it. If you don't have a hear that, then you'll have missed some things. I believe that the advice to try to get to substantive comments as soon as possible is always intended to assist the applicant in moving through the process as quickly as possible. They want to take more time, certainly you can provide them with more time. I'd like now to ask the board. I see one, one question on completeness. Maureen, does substance and completeness overlap at all on the point of citing? One of the, one of the items is whether or not the, the you, the deciding could be done and right. until you have sufficient evidence on the adequacy of the siding, mm -hmm. which is a completeness issue as well as a substance issue, how do we decide completeness? Completeness does not mean it is adequate. Right. So completeness means that sufficient information has been provided for you to initiate the review. Okay. That so. doesn't mean that you cannot then decide that if you don't get more information provided, you can find that the standards are not met. Okay. Right. We agree. Elaine, did you have a question? Well, I think we need to determine whether we're given sufficient information to um, dis decide whether or not this subpart F exterior materials is satisfied. And for that, we have to believe we have sufficient information as to the quality of the materials, as to its compatibility with nearby buildings. So I think if we have information sufficient to satisfy all of the criteria in this subpart F as to the siding material, then we can deem the information complete. I guess my concern is if we're not permitted to mention information that some of us, not me, because I haven't done any independent research, um, that, that some of us may have come across, which may lead us to think that the information provided is incomplete because it's missing some crucial information that somebody might have found elsewhere then I'm not sure how to assess completeness if we can't talk about the questions we might have about something you, can, you present. So I, I kind of feel that our hands are tied. We're being asked to proceed in a way that this planning board has never been asked to proceed before. Um, and I think we have to look to our town planner and our town attorney to, to know whether the standard you're asking us to comply with is a mandatory standard. It's different than what we have done in the past in proceeding, and I'm not sure I feel that I can tell whether, unless we can have a little discussion, whether that material provided, in fact, meets all that's right here. If I may could you respond, no. it would be devastating to us if you could not do a completeness review tonight. There is a difference between whether we have submitted something to address the standard and whether we've met the standard. It's not if, we, if you don't find that we have enough information to uh, meet the standard that therefore it's not complete. And I think that's what the town planner was, was saying. But, we, but I, I can say it myself. All right. Well, well, all right, fine. Thank you for letting me to be part of this dialogue. Uh, but we do ask that this board uh, uh, determine wh that whether or not we have submitted all of the um, ma materials addressing each one of the, uh, issue, the um, aspects of your completeness uh, sheet. Uh, I know that uh, Pat Carroll met with the town planner back in uh, October, and, and for that completeness review, I believe that she has found it to be complete, and, we, and, and administratively, that is what we need. Uh, this has been tens of thousands of dollars, and I think everyone wants to finish this. Um, this will be a devastating in terms of completing this uh, restaurant if you can't even come up with a completeness review tonight. I guess I must say in response, you talked about things being presented to you tonight to which you had not had a chance to respond. This is the first time that we have been told that our procedure is not consistent with the legal requirements. That's what you're telling us. We have not had a chance to confirm 
whether your request of our procedure is correct or not. The only way we can confirm whether your information is correct would be for us to have had advance notice of your concerns so that we could confer with our town attorney. Without that advance notice, I don't know whether what we can and what we can't say. I know your view of it, and your view of it is different from the way in which we would normally proceed. So since this is the first time that we have heard your concern on that respect, I think it's maybe appropriate for us to say that we don't feel we can proceed until we have our appropriate legal advice, because essentially you're giving us legal advice. Well, and, but what, I'm, what we're saying is that the issue of um, the site visit yesterday and the online research today, the reason why we didn't give you advance notice is because we didn't know until yesterday afternoon and this afternoon. So we didn't know about those, but we consider the fact that there was a planning board member that went to the site yesterday and that there was a, uh, a planning board member that indicated online research today to be separate from the completeness review. The fact that it was right or wrong is irrelevant as to whether our application is complete. And what we're trying to say is please provide due process for the board to say we're not going to consider whether you're complete because we don't like what you've said about the site visit and our online research. No, that's I not what I'm that. saying. It has, nothing, it has to do with the nature in which we are permitted to conduct our discussion tonight about right. the issue may I, may I do of this? completeness. You're right. giving us a legal opinion on that point. Right. May I just say this? We waive all objections have, as to your question. But if you would allow the planning right. board and our planner right. to complete their conversations right. before interrupting, that is also the way that we proceed at the Cape Elizabeth Planning Board. Perhaps other planning boards are different. We don't interrupt each other. It's not helpful to interrupt us, particularly to interrupt a planning board member or the planning director allow us to finish our statements. Thank you. So let me finish my statement. You're attempting to give us legal advice that as terms of what is proper behavior for the planning board in considering an application, what we can discuss and what we can't discuss. If we can't take legal advice from you, right. as you know, right. we need to have an opportunity to get legal advice right. from the sources from which we get that advice. This is a new issue requesting a new procedure and it seems to me that we have to have our own advice as to what we can say and what we can't say so if you're presenting information and someone here believes that you're only giving us half of the story or a quarter of the story on a description of the products that you're using we you're telling us we can't say that to me that's part of completeness you disagree with that you I'm going to, I would advice. like to agree with you though. I'm trying to agree with you. And that, what is the, and that is, it's so important us, for us to have this completeness determination tonight that with, hope that my client is all right with this, we will waive any objection to any question tonight. So okay, that you do as long not as that's have, the record. Is that, if, that, if that satisfies you, yes. then as to anything you've been online, but for going forward, let's come up with a better process. Is that well, a fair? As for, in terms of what we do going forward, I would not agree to that unless okay. our attorney tells us that your process is what we must We can do. evaluate going forward. Okay, but as for tonight, yeah. as long as you're willing to waive on the record any objection to bias in terms of what we might say or questions we might ask, then I think we can go forward. Okay. And so it's a deal. <laughs> I just want to say, unfortunately, I have to leave, but it sounds like we're on a path forward to evaluate completeness, okay. make a vote, and I'll be watching from home. All right, thank you. Okay, so I'm not an attorney. What was that last thing? Can I just, it, it was a waiver for Objections to due process. Any right. objections to due process. Due and process, I, fairness, bias, yes, in order. anything that might happen in terms of our discussion tonight. Okay, I'm looking to the attorneys. Yeah, I, and, All right, the right I'm not an attorney, so I don't feel comfortable trying to carry on a conversation with you at which I did not go and get my graduate degree from law school. I do want to say to you, when Rudy's was here last and they got their approval, we said it was someone on this board, and we'll leave it anonymous, but what a great plan. This looks really good. 
congratulations, we hope the best. And when another applicant came forward and they said, we would like to do a commercial project in this town, we said, look to Rudy's. Rudy's did a really nice job. I don't know why then you came forward and now we're not at that place where we left off. We left off at a really good spot. I, I, and I just, I, I, very unfortunate. I, I wish Pat had just started off. We worked with Pat a number of times. It's gone very well. I, I, I regret that we had to start off by throwing the attorney up there. Um, normally we work with engineers, landscape architects, and it goes very well. I, I've never had a meeting. I've been doing this five years. I've, and we've had attorneys show up before, but I, I, this is unfortunate. And I hope the board can also have an open mind and, and let's get past this because you have been, Rudy's, not you, Rudy's, Rudy's has been the model that we ask others to adhere to. I'm very sorry that for the last 45 minutes we've had to sit through this discussion about what we're doing wrong. When we're here to say you folks were doing it right and to hear that now we're doing it wrong Let's all put it behind us. Let's just try to go forward. Um, we've worked very well with the representatives in the past, and hopefully you can stay seated and we won't have to hear from you again, because I really, we've worked well with the other people, and I would like to get it back on track so that we once again can say, your role model here in town is Rudy's. Look to Rudy's. It's done so well, a great job. And Pat, I'll now throw it open to you. Okay, well. <laughs> You're dreaming. Um, it's quite a, uh, quite something to have to follow. But um, anyway, hopefully we can kind of uh, continue the, the discussion here tonight and kind of end on a good note and uh, move forward with uh, a public hearing next month. Um, as you know, there, there are six items, uh, citing being the most um, important and valuable to the board and to the owner. Uh, but there are six items that have come up during the process of construction, design and construction of, of Rudy's. And this is very typical in a project, as you know, Joe knows and anybody that's been involved in development and anybody that's been on the board for a number of years knows that as a project evolves during design, a lot of times when a project comes in for approval, site plan approval, uh, we might be at 50% of design completion. And as the project evolves, both to get to a point of construction and also during construction, there are, there are multitudes of things, mostly just minor little changes that occur. And unfortunately, in Cape Elizabeth, um, neither the planner nor the code officer has the ability to kind of uh, review these minor changes and consider them a de minimis change and, and allow the owner or the contractor to kind of continue with construction. So that's why we're, we're here tonight with five of the six items. Um, and I'm going to go through the five easy ones, and then I'm going to let Phil talk about the siding, because clearly the siding is the most contentious and um, the most kind of misunderstood of, of all of them. I'm hoping that, um, that and maybe this is too much to request of the board, but these five items, which are site lighting, curbing, the water line, generator, and the ability to have uh, some raised garden planters on the site, I'm, I'm hoping that they're simple enough that I would request that perhaps, uh, once the board finds com the application complete, that there might be substantial review and perhaps even approval of those five items tonight. Now, maybe that's too much to ask, um, but again, they're, they're all very minor items, and um, I think, you know, they were, they were reviewed quite, in quite a bit of detail at the workshop, and um, we've had staff review, we've had uh, the town engineers review, and, and everybody seems to be in agreement that, that these 
items can, can happen. So I, I'm, I'm making that request. I don't know how the board's going to feel about that, but, but again, given the time and so forth, if, if in fact we could whittle down this list from six to one and come back in November with a public hearing just on the siding, that would be ideal. Um, so the six, the six items are, again, site lighting, curbing, water line, uh, location of a generator, um, and raised planters, and then the siding is the sixth. Site lighting, um, what, we've, what, we've, uh, what we've, we've requested is to uh, make a substitution from uh, metal halide uh, lighting, which was what was approved, uh, to an LED type fixture. And it's, it's exactly the same kind of overall uh, fixture itself, it's just the lamp inside is um, converted from metal halide to LED. And LED is, is a much more efficient um, fixture, it lasts, you know, 50,000 hours or so. Um, it's, it uses very little energy, it's a very green, um, green design type of uh, improvement and it's, it's become much more popular and cost effective than it ever has been before. Um, so that's, that's one of the requests we're having and, and in addition to that what we've done is actually Paul has taken another look at the lighting plan, the photometrics and said that there are a couple of small areas that, that really weren't very well lit previously. So we've, we're adding two additional pole lights to the project. Uh, one located here at the entrance, and another one is located in the back, adjacent to kind of the, the back parking and the uh, dumpster area back there. So we've, we've had a new photometrics uh, provided for, for that, including those fixtures. Uh, they meet the town standards. They think the minimum or the maximum at any point in the property line is out along here, and maybe back in here it's 0.4 candles, which is less than what the, what the town standard is. So we're requesting that we be able to make that change in, in the site plan relating to lighting. Again, I think, you know, I think, I don't know if I mentioned it or not, but, you know, all of these improvements that, are, that we're proposing um, have really been made in an effort to improve the quality and the aesthetics of this project. And, you know, all of them as uh, Peggy has indicated, are costing more money than, than what would, uh, we would typically be looking at for this. So again, we're looking at more, more costs for the LEDs, we're adding fixtures, um, both, and, um, and the same thing with any of the other improvements, like the curbing and so forth. All of these are adding cost to the project, but we feel like there's a, there's a real benefit um, in the long run. So I just wanted to make that clear. Um, we did submit, and um, as part of the record, uh, the site plan and landscaping plan both indicate where the new fixtures are, where all the fixtures are, and there has been a photometrics plan uh, that has been submitted that, that illustrates that we do meet the uh, town standards. Um, there was, I think I can talk about it a little bit later, but there was in a staff memo from Maureen, there was, uh, she had noted that uh, one of the building mounted lights on the north side of the Rudy's, which is this light right here, it's over the, uh, the side entrance to the apartment, was not included in the photometrics plan. We've um, had the photometrics plan redone and we submitted those back to Maureen um, the other day. So uh, we've taken care of that, that issue. Uh, regarding curbing, um, Initially, all of the curbing on the site was going to be uh, bituminous curbing, and it was a combination of either vertical bituminous curbing or uh, slope Cape Cod type curbing. Uh, the vertical curbing adjacent to where there's sidewalks, the Cape Cod adjacent to, um, to landscape or lawn areas. Uh, we've taken another look at that, and Paul's come back and said, you know, I really like this slip form curbing, and we've, we've had experience on probably four or five projects over the last couple of years using that. It's a fairly new product. City of South Portland, that's all they use now for all of their sidewalks is uh, slip form concrete. So if you drive up, say, Mitchell Road, you'll see it. You'll see it kind of in lots of different neighborhoods around, around South Portland. 
It looks, it's got the same form as a, as a bituminous curving, but it's actually made out of concrete. It's a reinforced concrete that actually is extruded out from a machine similar to what the bituminous curving is, but it just lasts a whole lot longer. It doesn't get beat up from snow plows and, and uh, it actually aesthetically is even a little bit nicer looking. So um, within the project itself, everything within the project, so all of the curving that wraps around the parking area here, wraps around these islands and around the back is all proposed uh, now to be extruded concrete slip form curving. Uh, Paul asked us to take another look and at the entrance out here. Again, this is all this is all bituminous curving along Route 77 at the entrance where it's typical for snow plows to kind of come in and kind of hit those corner those radiuses and um, really kind of destroy them in a pretty short period of time. Um, he's, he's asked us to uh, install granite curbing there. So again, within the public right of way, at the entrance only, uh, we're proposing uh, granite curbing, which again is, is an upgrade. It's, it's a higher quality material that'll last forever. Um, and then finally, um, along the rest of Route 77, Uh, we're proposing to leave that as bituminous. Uh, that's been discussed with Bob Malley and, uh, and the town engineer, and, and they're in agreement that that's, that's fine there. So that's, that's really the change regarding curbing. And again, it's an upgrade. It's more costly to the owner, uh, but in the long run, it's going to last longer and it's going to look better. And by the way, those, uh, the details for those uh, new curbing, um, proposed curbing sections have been included in the, in the plans. There are, there are details now on the detail sheet, L4, I believe it is, that uh, indicate how that curbing would be installed. The third item is the water line. And if you remember back uh, when we were at the workshop, there was some discussion about um, the water line and reducing the size from six inches, which is what was shown for fire service to, to both buildings, uh, to two inches, which was based on uh, the requirements of the sprinkler system. So the sprinkler design, what happens is we typically show a six inch line or a four inch line coming into the property and then there's a, there's, there's a sprinkler contractor that actually designs the fire suppression system. And once he designs that, that has to go up to the state and be reviewed and approved by the state fire marshal. And so at the time that, that the original approval was made, you know, this is really a design decision that isn't made till very late in the process. And so, um, so Paul's uh, sprinkler installer contractor actually designed the system, went up, got state fire marshal approval, and found out that we really only required a two-inch line to service the, the Rudy's building for fire service. So instead of a six-inch line, we requested a two-inch line. And again, this is a minor thing that really, I mean, water lines, I'm not sure, are really even part of the, the town purview of, of sorts. Uh, it's really kind of Portland Water District. So we went through the Portland Water District. Um, that was all kind of agreed to. There's, uh, as part of the application, there, was a, there were some uh, agreements. There's a lot of documentation in there regarding the water line. And what we ended up with is um, there's actually, the, the, there's another part to this story, and that is that um, when, when the Two Lights Professional Building was built, uh, the water line was supposed to come down Davis Point Road and then. And instead, the Water District actually ran a line basically through these two buildings connecting directly to the, uh, to the office building. So there was a six inch line and a two inch line that were actually running through our property serving the, the abutting property. And um, those lines ended up getting relocated, I think at Paul's expense. And, um, and through working with the water district, we were able to utilize those lines to serve our new building. So the two inch, the dedicated two inch line will become a dedicated fire service line uh, for Rudy's. And, um, and then off that six inch line, there'll be two two inch lines that, that are 
serve for domestic service for Rudy's building, one two-inch line for domestic service for the Phase Two building, and a two-inch line that will be a dedicated fire service for the, for the Phase Two building. So all five of those lines are coming off of the existing, um, existing lines that were previously serving the, the uh, office building. So that's all been approved by the Water District. And um, I know I talked with Steve Harding, the town engineer, last week. I think it was last Friday. And uh, he was satisfied with it. I haven't seen anything in writing yet, but he indicated to me that as long as the Water District was satisfied with it, he was satisfied with it. So that's the, uh, that's the water line issue. Um, the next is the generator, and the gen there was uh, the generator is something new that was really never contemplated back when the original site plan was approved. And um, what Paul has discovered is that you know occasionally the power does go out here. It's not often, but it's it does happen. Um, if you have a restaurant and you have refrigerators and freezers and and things like that, it uh, could have a ser serious impact. Um, it also allows the ability for Rudy's to stay open and serve residents of, of the neighborhood and the town in case there is a, a long-term power shortage. So um, he had us look at, at locating a, a portable generator, not a portable, but a um, auxiliary generator on the site. Um, and um, it's a 20 kilowatt generator. It's, it's made by Kohler. There's probably 200 of them in town that are, that are kind of connected to your neighbor's houses. Um, it's a residential scale generator. Uh, it runs off of propane and it comes in a closed box. It's, uh, it's fairly quiet, but I have to say that there's not a generator out there that will meet the town's noise ordinance as it, as it currently exists. Um, so, um, so we've located that generator out here, which is about as far away from the building and as far away from the butters as we could, we could make it. Um, it's actually it's about 70, 70 feet to the property line here. It's about almost 100 feet to the property line to the south. And it's about 90 feet to Route 77. So it's, it's out there. It will be located adjacent to the, uh, to the propane tanks. And then we'll run a line back, a conduit back to feed, feed the building itself. And we've done, um, we've taken a look at, at the noise standards and we've taken a look at what the noise is generated by this, by this generator. Uh, we hired a, an acoustic engineer to take a look at the project and um, he's come back and what we're proposing is to enclose this in a six foot high solid wood fence uh, with some sound baffles on the inside. Um, we believe that that will, that will adequately attenuate the, the noise from the, from the generator. I know Maureen has also mentioned in her memo that uh, the board may want to consider um, adding a note to the plan or as a condition of approval that, um, that the generator only be run at full, full um, capacity when there is actually is a power outage, which seems like a no-brainer because you wouldn't be running it otherwise other than for testing which never runs at full full capacity so um, we think with with the enclosures that we're providing and the distance away from property lines um, that we're, we're we're able to meet the, the town noise standard in that regard I believe the the letter from the acoustic engineer was actually part of your application too and then finally, this is, this is again kind of a no-brainer, but um, uh, Paul has asked us to locate some raised planters on the site. And the idea here is to create kind of this farm-to-table experience or kind of uh, um, what he'd like to do is grow his own vegetables and herbs that he might use in the kitchen. And um, so we took a look at this. The only place that really made sense um, is really to locate those along the side of the parking lot here. So it'd be adjacent to the parking, adjacent to the, uh, to the sidewalk that runs down through there. Uh, they'll be attractive. They're four by eight 
and we're looking at any number of those, um, and they'd be raised up, you know, approximately 24 inches or so above grade. Um, you know, he could plant lettuce and tomatoes and herbs and uh, those kinds of um, those kinds of things in those planters. So, and when I talked to Maureen and actually Ben when we all met, uh, they indicated that we should really approach this as, a, as an optional kind of improvement on the property that we may, because it may not happen, but if it did happen, we'd, he, neither of them wanted us to have to come back to you guys again. So, um, so that's, that's the location of those. On the landscape plan, I believe there's a detail for what those uh, raised planters would be made out of. I think they're four by six or six by six uh, cedar timbers. Um, again, I think they'll be handsome. I think they'll, they'll add some, some character and ambiance to the project. Might even screen a little bit of the parking lot from the road. Um, so those are really kind of the, the five issues that I had. Um, we did get a memo from Maureen with some, with some um, comments. And we also received a letter from uh, Steve Harding at AMAC with some comments. Um, we've addressed both of those. We sent a, a memo back to Maureen, um, sent that yesterday, I believe, or Monday. And uh, um, I'm not sure if she's shared that with, with the group or not. But um, the intent here is to continue that, that dialogue back and forth. And um, we'll be following up with, um, with a formal kind of uh, resubmission of any kind of plans that have changed um, in time for the, uh, for the public hearing. But again, I think you know, these five items are such minor in nature that um, we would gratefully request that uh, perhaps the board consider um, delving into those tonight and perhaps granting approval without a, going to public hearing on those five, understanding that the siding is really uh, a major issue. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Phil, or actually, Peggy. <laughs> and um, these guys have some great things to share about this side. I want to say that my evil twin, Peggy McGee, he was here earlier this evening. So I'm here to talk about uh, the standard that Ms. Fallander was raising about the design standards and, and how we feel that the court and siding uh, meets that standard. Uh, she had talked about the compatibility. I believe the board at its uh, workshop said a focus on compatibility and on the look. We don't care if it's aluminum or steel. We want to know if this is compatible. And that's what we would like to do. I'm going to speak a little bit about the standard. And then uh, uh, Phil will uh, talk about the, um, provide some photographs and, and, and further explanation about the quality of the siding. Um, I wish I could put up my, uh, PowerPoint for you, but uh, I'm just going to be speaking from it. Um, your design guidelines on exterior materials uh, say, excuse me for going through it, facade materials give a structure character, exterior materials shall be compatible with nearby buildings and with the design of the structure. No structure addition shall consist of architectural materials inferior in quality, appearance, or detail to any other exterior of the same building. The use of copper is permitted. I'm just pulled out the copper. That'll be coming up in a minute. And the use, and I think that uh, the rest of it, I'm going to just skip through uh, for you. Uh, so we um, focused, uh, as uh, proposed by the uh, board members at the workshop, on compatibility with the design of the structure, but mostly with the uh, nearby buildings. And uh, as a uh, Phil will get into a bit more is that we do feel that this weathering steel siding is compatible with the structure's design and with quality and appearance and the detail of the rest of the structure. It is a high quality exterior material. Uh, it's attractive, it's high cost, and it's been successfully used in other high-end residential commercial buildings. Uh, Phil's going to provide you some examples here in Maine and New England. We did provide you website references about uh, where they talk about how it is um, something that rusts naturally with exposure to the weather, a natural oxidizing finish, providing beautiful color and texture. It uh, eliminates the need for paint. 
um, and gives a unique appearance. Uh, and you have those website references. It's also an environmentally green material. It gives a building lead points uh, for materials and resources. And this, we would think, would be of, of uh, value uh, to the town. It's also consistent with its architectural design. Uh, the verticality of that pattern coordinates with the horizontal boards above it. And uh, Phil will speak more to that. So I'm speaking a little bit more about its compatibility with nearby buildings. Because what we think we have here is this weathering appearance is consistent with uh, the town's own historic seaside textures. You've got weathering uh, shingles. You've got weathered stones. Um, and, we, and you also have, in, in Cape Elizabeth, creative, high-quality design features in your buildings. And this is intended to reflect that. It's compatible with those standards. We have, and I believe you have, a number of comments from the residents. And really, we think that probably the strongest testament to compatibility is what the residents are saying. Um, so we just have little snippets from uh, the letters, uh, among the letters. I don't know how many you have. Uh, so here's one resident who says, the court and siding brings to the building elements that are Cape Elizabeth, the waves and the corrugation, the history of the town in the oxidation. The new Rudy's is something we can be proud of in its thoughtful design. Another resident said, I drive by Rudy's twice a day. I love the materials. Another one said, I'm a Cape Elizabeth resident. I have to pull in and out of the driveway right before Rudy's restaurant for work. It looks fine. Someone else said, we see nothing wrong with the siding and the patina fish, the finish. We urge the board to let this gem of a restaurant get built as planned. Another one, former manager of Rudy's, says, I look out the window every day, and I've watched the progress of this new one. I like it. Many of my patients like it. Three of my patients are architects, and they rave about the building, and they talk about how beautiful the metal is going to look as it ages. In my opinion, the building is very appropriate for the type of business it will be, and quite attractive as well. Someone else said, I love the design of the building. It's contemporary and sophisticated update to the classic Maine lobster shack. It's a work of art, the patina beams and all. Another one said, our family loves the look of the new place. The oxidized steel is contemporary and rustic at the same time. And I like this. They referred to their mother-in-law, who is a curator of two house museums and repeatedly comments on what a fabulous building. Three more comments. Our front office is directly adjacent to the western wall of Rudy's. We don't find the building offensive or visually unappealing. The current, current owner has meticulously planned the construction of this facility. Somebody else said, I really like the new design and structure of the new Rudy's. Really like having a building, I really like having a building like this around. Brings a nice feel. And the last one is, I'm a Cape Elizabeth resident. Writing in support of the appearance of Rudy's, I drive by the building almost daily. I find the exterior to be attractive. I think Rudy's will be a great addition to our town. So there, there are residents who find this to be a consistent, um, compatible siding. And we, find, we uh, urge you to think of this as, on its freestanding consideration, to fit with the seaside character of the town. But there's one more standard that we would ask you to consider. In your design guidelines, let me just say that in your design guidelines, you have um, drawings to show what is considered compatible for orientation, for example. So if buildings have kind of a diagonal uh, fit, to be consistent, you want diagonal fits. Or with the roofing, with points as opposed to squared. With material, exterior materials, what you are looking do what the design guidelines do is give examples of what's considered compatible objectively copper is listed and copper looks like core 10 metal, metal siding it doesn't have this blue patina it has a brown patina and so the because it's a specifically permitted siding and you've asked us to, to address the look for compatibility we uh, phil has some photographs to show you what copper siding looks like next to what Corten siding looks, Corten siding looks like. And I, he stricked me. I can't figure out which one's which. Uh, and for that reason, we would say objectively, because copper is already found to be compatible by the town under the gu guidelines, that this um, oxidizing steel would also be found.
compatible. And I turn this over to Phil uh, to show you, to address the rest of the uh, standard. Boy, I sure wish I could show you some of the pretty pictures I have right here. Um, so I'm going to just do my best. Uh, so what, I, what I'm going to do tonight is show you some images of core 10 steel or weathering steel next to copper and how they relate to each other and how they look really similar. Then I'm going to talk a little bit about my experience with, with weathering steel over the last 12 years. I've used it as the third project I've used it on. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about why we used it uh, on Rudy's of the Cape. So I'm going to do my best here, and I'll certainly follow up by handing these images out. And they may be absolutely useless to you at this size, but um, please be patient. Understand stuff's not working tonight, so we'll do the best we can. And I'll pass these around and we can talk about it. Um, so here we have one image that's core 10 and one image that's copper. Okay. So the goal of, of these images is to show the similarity in the texture and the weathering of the, of the two materials. Side by side, uh, sometimes you can't tell which is which. The material itself does not predispose any style. You can use copper on a contemporary building. You could use Corten on a traditional building. This is showing images of copper on a more contemporary building and with two more traditional forms showing Corten. That's all regular copper, right? Not lead-coated. I'm sorry? That's the all regular copper, not lead-coated. Correct. This is all regular copper. You got it. it this is showing um, two images adjacent to shingles. I'm going to look at this without looking at it here. Okay, so it can be used in traditional temporary forms again, next to wood. It blends well. In this case, copper, core 10. Sometimes they switch around. Sometimes the, the copper is darker than the core 10. Sometimes the core 10 is brighter. Um, things that affect this are the age of the application, but very specifically the geography, where in the world this material is put on. Um, so that's why it's really hard to predict. Um, that's why you don't see warranties about how this is going to weather. And one of the things that's really nice, you see this a lot in, in Europe uh, and the United States, but really Corten is more prevalent in Europe where they put Corten and the warmer materials adjacent to historic buildings, particularly brick and natural wood. And this one's in Blue Hill, Maine. And this one is copper. This one is core 10. Virtually indistinguishable in these images. Another couple images that are, again, really hard to tell. I've fooled a number of people with, with these two images. Copper, core 10. Again, the core 10 is uh, a little bit darker in this image. So this project right here, something I started working on in 2002. It's on Great Diamond Island. It's the, it was the first time I've ever used weathering steel at all on a project. A client came to me and they were excited about it. So um, we did a bunch of research. Uh, we tested a few panels. And when they got comfortable with it, we decided to order it for the project. Uh, the goal of this project was to be a project that had zero maintenance. It has no paint, no paintable services in the project. It is on Great Diamond Island, so it's certainly much closer to the water than Rudy's is on all sides. Uh, I was there last year. Core 10 is doing great. It's going through his regular wetting and drying cycle, building up the protective patina and making it what it is. It's a project that some of you may have seen. This one was completed in 2008. Uh, this is a picture from a few years later. Um, we did our own testing on this, on this project to ensure the protective patina was forming. We laid out a few pieces within 75 feet of the water and tested them for about six weeks. Uh, noticed that the patina had formed. 
Um, the key that it was that it wasn't subject to consistent salt spray. As long as it had the ability to wet and dry on a regular basis, the patina could form. This is in Falmouth, yes. And this is about 150 feet from the water, and it faces out to Mac Macworth Island. And here this is. Maybe I can pin this up as we talk. Everybody can see that really clearly. <laughs> so what we've done there is uh, rendered in the landscape, but it's from an actual photo that was taken uh, about a month ago. So you can see some of the weathering that had been done, uh, and some of it still has some weathering to do. Uh, our sidewalk originally determined that there are no valid precedents in the general vicinity on which to base compatibility. Still, we've done that in form, siting, and massing. This doesn't seem to be an issue based on our original planning board presentation, but I'd be glad to go into it in more detail if, if anyone deems it relevant. The building is intended to have a rich, warm, and durable base, which is connected to the landscape in both texture and color. The natural softening of the steel is very much akin to the weathered look we see all around us in this town. From the many shingled, rustic waterfront cottages to your own storied Fort Williams, all moss and proud stone. The scale of the materials change as you move up the building, with the gable consisting of thinner, more frequently spaced battens. Originally, we had this as decorative shingles, but eventually chose to limit the number of different materials on the building. We had believed this not to be substantive enough of a change to bring back to the board, as it is a hardy product made of fiber cement board and specifically permitted under the design guidelines. Okay. We wanted to make sure that the materials reflect the age, context, and belong, belonging to a seaside town, which this is. Okay. We're proud of this building. We're really happy with how it turned out. We've actually gotten a couple new jobs uh, that come directly from people driving by this building in the last three weeks. They really love the look and feel, uh, and it's a great thing to be discussing architectural design in Cape Elizabeth. Um, one more note is uh, that this weathering steel, also known as A606, that's the formulation that we're using on this building, is expected to, have, expected to last about 120 years under ideal conditions. Now, we're not talking about longevity and durability under the design guidelines, but it was one of the reasons that we did choose this material. As long as the sufficient wet and dry cycles have already occurred as anticipated, uh, they form the protective patina. And that's what's happening right now in this building, and that's what has happened over the last two months as this uh, application of weathering steel has been on the building. So this in and of itself means that this microclimate is suited to the application and the siting is appropriate. The proof is on the building. Thank you. Are you going to jump up again, or are you all done? I'm talking oh, to Peggy. Thank you, Pat. I'd like to hear from Pat. Uh, no, I think, I think we're, that concludes our um, presentation for tonight. I would add to Phil's uh, conclusion on this is that um, uh, Phil also had submitted some information to Ben McDougall. Uh, there, there is a code requirement for thickness of uh, wall panels on metal siding, and I think it's 0 0.014 or 15 inches, millimeters or something. But anyway, uh, this well exceeds that as far as minimum thickness, so um, you know, we meet all code requirements. Um, and even Phil has done some calculations, even if in fact it, um, it weathers and thins out a little bit, even at its, at, its, at its minimum point. You want to talk about this? Sure. sure. I can certainly clarify. I didn't know who was of interest, but, I'll, but I certainly will. Okay, so that, um, the, there's not a wealth of data online about this, but data, the data that we have found shows that, that the, the maximum corrosion is about two millimeters. Um, down from about 75 millimeters uh, in an environment much closer to the salt water from our project to form the protective layer on each side. So essentially, if it starts at 0.75 and erodes 0.2 millimeters on each side, worst case scenario, um, it leaves us with a 0.5 millimeter thickness. 
uh, and code requires a 0.38. So we're covered. Ben seems to be absolutely fine with, with this, uh, whether it corrodes or not. So that has been vetted. You all set, Pat? I'm all set. Okay. All set. All right, then. i throw it back to the board. We do need to take a vote. Okay. I have a question. Yes, go ahead. Um, one of the things I looked for as I was going through all the materials is information about the pad for the generator and what it's going to be made out of. I mean, the pad, the pad information for the uh, propane tanks is included in the plans. But I couldn't, and if I just missed it, just tell me. I know where the pad's located, but I couldn't find what it was being constructed out of. There's a, um, on sheet L1.0, there's a detailed copy. Is that? It's about the propane generator layout. Mm -hmm. The layout, yep. Right, and there's a note on here that says generator 26 by 48 inches on crushed stone pad. So it's on a similar pad. Oh, it's, the, uh, okay the propane tanks are sitting on. Okay. Okay. Um, I actually forgot to ask if anyone from the public would like to speak on completeness. Completeness meaning, do we have enough information in front of us to begin a subsequent discussion? I looked at everything. I'm Chris Weinberg. I uh, own 2 gauge point landing. And we have four tenants upstairs that kind of overlook the, um, the new restaurant. And I'm just concerned with uh, the new lighting that's going to be added in the back of Rudy's and the amount of wattage that that would um, throw out. And will, will it affect the, uh, the tenants upstairs? Um, and also with the curbing, um, I'm concerned that Rudy's uh, lot has been raised about two feet and uh, as we all know water runs downhill um, therefore with the pitch of, of, the, uh, of the lot and so, of the parking lot in some areas I'm just concerned um, and I don't know about the new curbing if that will divert things the way they should be but I'm concerned that that water could you know, make its way to our property um, and affect, you know, our wetland area even more. Or a as it is now, we've had some sand wash onto our parking lot um, from the construction. And I know the curb's gone up yet, and hopefully that will be taken care of. But um, that's one of our, our concerns. And also, you know, I'm glad to hear that the generator will be away from the tenants because I. I worry that our tenants upstairs, which are residential um, apartments, would, would, would hear the, uh, the noise of the generator. So those are our, our three concerns, I guess. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Any comments from the board in regards to prior to taking our vote on completeness? Elaine. This is one of the pieces of material that you submitted to us on Core 10. And it says, special care should be taken in detailing projects to allow for proper isolation of the material from incompatible substrates and to allow for proper runoff to avoid possible staining from early releases of iron oxide. Um, I'm not sure what the implication of that is. Are we going to have rust running off the property? Or can you explain what this means? Sure. Um, essentially what this means, it has more of an implication to the materials below it. Uh, as water uh, runs over the material over and over again on a repeated basis, occasionally you will see drips of staining below the materials that are directly below that material. So uh, that's why it's typically seen on the base of a project. Uh, in terms of the actual staining that you'll see on the landscape or the, or the, the drainage below, it, it, it's extremely minimal. Um, in the research that I've done, it's never, I've never seen anybody see it, uh, call it out as a real issue. 
Uh, in terms of your other comment, the dissimilar materials, um, that's absolutely true. What we've done in the detailing here is that it can only really touch stainless steel or more uh, weathering steel. And if, it, if that's not the case, then you need a gasket between the dissimilar materials, which we've done. So if I'm looking at the photograph here. Looks like it doesn't actually come all the way down to the sidewalk. Is that, is that what you're trying to say? Is that what you're saying? Because it looks like, since it's at the bottom layer of the building, and if you're concerned about what's below it, it seems to me that the sidewalk and the landscaping are right below it, and therefore it could have some rainwater. That's right. There is landscaping directly below that. Okay. In some places, it looks like sidewalk, but that's just... Mm -hmm. It may be the case. We believe it's an absolutely minor concern. All settling? I've had the same issue in a couple of projects um, where there's been a little bit of exposed concrete and there hasn't been staining. Okay. Well, that explains the sentence. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, John. So I'm a little hesitant to ask you this, Bill. <laughs> yeah. But... The reason I sent that email out initially is that the thing with port pen is when you first put it on the building, it's very bright, it's full of contrast, and it really jumps out at it. And over time, it mellows out and becomes more uniform. And to read what I was hoping you would be able to show us is some idea of the progression from when you first put it on over time, how it ages and what it will eventually look like. Um, and I, you know, I don't know, that image I just grabbed, that was my 37 seconds of Google research. But I came up with that, and I don't know how accurate it is, obviously. But, um, so I, I don't know if you can just talk about that. Or well, in my research, things darken over time but it's so dependent on geography and site that there's no way that I can pull out something that shows you this is going to be five years, 10 years, 20 years. Another thing that's happened is that there's different formulations of weathering steel over time. So the one that you had, I didn't look at it really closely, but it could have been the original Corten steel, which I think was an A252, which might weather in a different climate than an A606. So it's really hard to determine that. We do know it softens over time. We do know it darkens. and we do know the essential character is going to be the same. So the only project it becomes more uniform. It darkens and it does become more uniform. It absolutely becomes more uniform. And the only the only project that I've found <clears throat> in Maine is the project that we had done. <clears throat> excuse me, that was finished in 2003. It has darkened and become more uniform. Um, you know how how dark is dark? I can certainly show more current pictures of that if the board feels that that, that would be relevant. Okay. And just for reference, this is the one that I was talking about. This, this is about five years old. And that was on Great Diamond Island. So that had some pretty serious exposure. If that gives you any clue. Phil, this is maybe a follow-up to the question. Once again, a very cursory look. Uh, Ziggersteed.com and Corten.com, I believe you've cited them both uh, in your submissions. <clears throat> they talk about certain climates being inappropriate for Corten, salt in the air, high rainfall, humidity, <coughs> persistent fog. That's in the Corten. Ziggersteed uh, had an actual example in, in Baltimore, which is not dissimilar from what we have here. Uh, it proved to be uh, a bad climate, um, <coughs> excuse me, due to the salt in the air and whatnot. And there seems to be at least a body of opinion, I'm not sure how big, that would say that this type of environment isn't right for Corten. And I appreciate the fact that you've done some properties with it. Uh, there seem to be some people who think otherwise. For the sake of completeness, I'm not sure I need to be satisfied, but I, I would like to raise the point now for the substantive discussion that there is a, 
a school of thought, at least, Portan doesn't belong in this environment. It belongs in a dry or something that has a distinct wet, dry, wet, dry uh, climate. And if you're talking about the appropriateness of the building material for here, I, you know, I think you ought to address that. And, and, Bring it, show us what you can about the other side of that question. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the key is that it does have to go through wetting and drying cycles. Where Corten has been, has had issues, has been with there, has not been, it has not had the ability to dry out. Salt spray is a, is a big problem, <clears throat> where it corrodes. Um, so, you know, me as an architect, this is on my head. If I don't get this right, then my client comes to me and it's, and it's a big time problem. So the only thing that I know how to do is put a piece of uh, Corten out on the site. And that's what I've done repeatedly to make sure it works. As long as I can see the wetting and the drying start to form this patina, then I get comfort, comfortable with the material on site. So um, that's what I had done in the past in a situation that was much closer to the water. And because I've been able to observe, observe it over a number of years, I've got confidence in it. Um, there are some numbers that are floating around um, that say whether it's one kilometer, two kilometers. Um, <clears throat> we're somewhere in between that. We're closer to one kilometer um, from, from the shore. Um, but we're certainly not right anywhere getting direct salt spray. Again, I've got two projects that I've put much closer to the water where the client was really excited about this project, and I, and I was excited about it too. So it was our responsibility to test it. So because I've got a number of years of experience and I've kind of done the research that makes me feel comfortable, I can recommend this to my client. And I feel good about standing in front of you guys and saying, this looks great, it's got great longe longevity, and it's going to hold up. And again, longevity and durability <clears throat> you know, are not part of what we're talking about with the design review necessarily. but. I look at this in my head and say, we were talking about 100 to 120 years. I mean, I'm not going to be around to check that out to see if it's true. But if worst case scenario, that, that number gets cut in half at 60 years. The life cycle for siding is like, for uh, cedar shingles is about 30. Hardy needs to get repainted in 16 or 17 or so. It's pretty big. So in terms of the rest of the materials on the building, I mean, I've, I've got zero concern as long as I see the wetting and drying cycles start to happen and the patina start to form like it has. Yes, Lorraine. I'd like to get back to the BA, the, dis, the standards of this particular BA zoning district. Looking at the exterior materials standard, it talks about compatibility with nearby buildings and I don't think we've heard anything about the nearby buildings, and I think the BA district is kind of unique in Cape Elizabeth, and there was quite a bit of discussion when it was recently amended. The standards in the BA district don't relate to the town of Cape Elizabeth as a whole. They relate to the compatibility of this business area with its immediately surrounding residential areas and the other multi-use buildings in that area. Now it also says in the introduction to the design requirements that the intent is not that all buildings should look the same, it doesn't all have to be white and gray, gray clabbered, but rather to encourage a mix of compatible styles, sizes, and characteristics. So I think we need to see information that compares this building to the nearby residential and commercial buildings, and I don't think we've seen that. I'm not saying that I would vote against completeness on that point, but it's certainly information that we still need to have presented in order to make any kind of a, a final determination. And I recall last time we did a site walk on Rudy's at an earlier stage of the project. That was a major issue that we looked at on the sidewalk. We looked at the buildings across the road, next door, and tried to determine that compatibility. It's a much more local compatibility than the kinds of general seaside coastal standards that have been the focus of the presentation so far. Sure. I mean, I understand that that's important. 
Um, the reason it's not included now is because of the site walk that we took and we determined that there were no real valid precedents. We can certainly talk about it in more detail, but we haven't included it, um, one, because of that, and two, because of the, the last plan what that we're beating. What was your, I didn't quite hear what you said the first time. Oh, I'm sorry. We didn't include it specifically um, this time, one, because the initial site walk, it didn't appear to be an issue. We didn't seem to find any valid um, precedents nearby as we walked around. That seemed to be the consensus of the group that walked around, and I may have misinterpreted that. Um, but that's why we haven't included it. And secondly, we got, when we got approved from the last planning board meeting, um, it didn't seem to be an issue, so we didn't raise it again. Okay, well, Sorry. maybe we have Can different... I address the point? Because I'm going to argue a little bit with my esteemed colleague here, uh, which was, is that w at least in the presentation that I have in the PowerPoint, we specifically tried to address the nearby buildings point. Okay, be good. And that's, and, and because um, you're right, it's, you're not going to find uh, core 10 buildings nearby. And so that's why we looked at the standard and does compatibility mean it ha you have to find the same material nearby? It doesn't. What it says is permitted materials, which per se are going to be compatible, includes copper. Now, we may not have, we may have cedar shingles all around you, but this, the town has already decided, per se, compatibility is with copper. And that's why we made this point that the town's design guidelines have already decided that copper is compatible with nearby buildings, whether or not there are copper buildings nearby. And so that's why we went to the length we did to say, you asked us to look at, not the build, the metal. Don't look at whether it's aluminum or steel. Look at the look. So we said, you, you've permitted, this town is permitted as compatible with nearby buildings copper. Our look of Core 10 is just like copper. So if objectively the design guidelines say that that is compatible, then so is Core 10. And that's why I think um, the uh, photographs that uh, hopefully are, are circulating among the board with a mixture of copper, oxidizing copper, and the oxidizing of steel, it's difficult to figure out which one is which. And so the, when we did address this, and I'm not sure how much more we can by saying we looked at the general compatibility in terms of seaside and the weathering aspect in Cape Elizabeth. We looked at general compatibility in terms of the quality because your design guidelines say, we want, we want quality in this appearance. And so we're saying, this is quality. You don't want to have something. I mean, you discourage aluminum. And there's a reason for that. And so uh, we've done the best we can to address. And if, unless it's supposed to be an impossible standard, you must look exactly like Cedar Shakes. Then we've, we, I'm not sure what more we can do there. Uh, we do have. A couple of references to the Lawn Center and uh, to, there's a five metal building, I'm trying to read this, on the landings maybe, is that, but there's, there are other commercial buildings, but uh, um, so we certainly can do more to address it, but we, we hope that you find that we have submitted enough tonight for your completeness determination. Can you, I ask, um, I got a question for you, Peggy. When I think of copper, I always think of something that turns green. Exactly. Why is this not so did I. Right. And because Why is it brown? Why are all your examples right. brown and not green? And, and because um, apparently copper these days turns brown. I mean, I think of the blue, you know, that aqua color. Uh, when I think we all think about that for the copper. Phil, I need your help here. The question the chair has asked is, we have shown how copper photographs of copper turning this brown color, and she was accustomed to the aqua color. And you've kind of given me an education about that, if you could kind of explain how copper tends to turn brown these days. I can't really educate the board more than that. I need to do more specific research before I answer this next time. Um, I, I know a lot about weathering steel at the moment and enough about copper to get myself into trouble, so I'm, I'm not going to do that right now. Okay. So, it, it really doesn't... It just, it was a quick question because it has nothing really to do with completeness. Because I'm not an architect, but um, I do know from working with several architects on buildings that have been sheathed in copper, 
that the formula for copper, the alloy itself, has changed over the, over the years. And that copper now doesn't have the same amount of whatever material it was that allowed it to oxidize to that green or blue color. Okay. And if you look around, you know, there's, there's that office building kind of down on, in Knightsville as you're kind of heading over the bridge. The whole upper part of that, that building was sheathed in copper. And if you look at it now, it's, it's a dark brown. It's very similar to kind of what some of the photos that Phil showed you. Uh, the, um, um, the, the fishery lab down on Commercial Street, I forget what that's called. The, mm -hmm. I know you're Green Research Laboratory. The roof on that, the whole upper part of the roof on that was all sheathed in copper. And that, again, that's probably been 10 years now. That's been there, eight or 10 years. That's just a pure brown color. So it, it just doesn't happen anymore. Okay, it, it was a little off topic. My apologies, but every time I hear copper, I keep thinking green. So anyways, let's get back on to um, completeness. Do you have a question? You're looking light when it's fine. The, uh, you do have a lot of sheet metal. It's one of the discouraged materials. Corten, I guess, is actually sheet metal, but it has the, the oxidizing properties of copper, you hope, although you agree you can't tell quite how it's going to come out. It's going to depend on the environment. Could you explain, though, why we shouldn't be concerned about the sheet metal uh, point? Um, well, we're making direct parallels to copper, which is also a sheet metal. Right. It doesn't, have, it doesn't necessarily have to be, and Corten doesn't necessarily have to be a sheet metal either. No, I understand, but in the vernacular, I think copper is one thing. Sheet, sheet metal is something a little bit different. Now, Corten is, it, it, it is metal, but it, you, I think you, I, I assume you're taking it out of the discouraged category because of the way it weathers and, and has a patina as opposed to just you know, like a corrugated metal building that rusts and looks ugly. Is, is that your point? Is that, is that how you distinguish the two? Right. I mean, that, that's, I mean, that's exactly our point. We are saying that this is more akin to the look and feel of copper, and that's why we're, we're trying to draw parallels between those two, uh, as opposed to talking about copper as a sheet metal. But if it, if it corroded unevenly, uh, and, and corroded, kept corroding beyond the patent, I think you'd agree that it might present a problem. Uh, it might, but it, we're very confident that that's not going to be the case. Are you all set, Pete? Yep. Thank you. Joe. Um, one of the things you might do to help me feel that it's a compatible material is look at some of the surrounding buildings and see if they also have some sort of base material that is different from the field material above it. Um, I mean, I think it's fairly common for buildings to have speed or stone or a heavy base of brick maybe that's heavier than the material above it and grounds the building. And I think you might argue this is some of modern interpretation of that um, behavior of materials. So that the compatibility is not, it's not a one for one, this is exactly what's out there, but it's being used in a similar way to give the building weight. Are you saying that you have a concern with that, Joe, or is this something oh, that you've I'm seen before? Because it's a tip, very typical I'm thing. Giving a yeah, <laughs> okay. Thank you. And one, one thing of note that I, I did um, chat with Paul for just a second. If you want to see the aging of the actual material, uh, Paul's been keeping a, a piece horizontally. Uh, so the wetting and drying cycles have been happening more recently. So they may show a little bit more aging than the materials that, that have been on the building um, for a couple of months vertically. If that would be useful, we provide. Any questions? Well, I wanted to mention to Peggy that uh, it is unfortunate that we couldn't see your PowerPoint. Would you like to share a hard copy of it with the board so that we can, you say it references other buildings in the area? Right? So, I wondered if you want you could send an electronic copy to yeah. New Maureen. Maureen can distribute it to us. Yeah. 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 Okay. 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 Uh, I mean, uh, you do have some version 
version of, of this, not a PowerPoint, that was included in the application. This is just tooling pieces out of it, but um, I'll go home tonight. I'll email it to Maureen, and I'm uh, very happy to have you review it. You mentioned that you referenced some, very, some specific buildings. And yes, and I think what may make more sense um, is to have my attachment and Phil's photo so that you've got all of it in front of you. Yes. Happy to do that. Okay, we are talking about completeness, so um, I'm, I would be ready to move on and take a vote. Um, and I just want to make sure, though, that um, I do have all the information that I feel that I need when I get to the second stage, the public hearing. I think we're, I, my questions are delving a little bit deeper than completeness. But if we could maybe, if I could tell you what I'm looking for and I could have some type of answer from, I'm, I'll be talking about the siding right now, whether or not you could provide this to me, it would help me know that I will have something to look at at the public hearing so that we can take this vote. So some of the um, questions that I had about this was um, could you prevent, uh, provide us with any warranty information about your product? I know Hardy Plank comes with warranties, but so what I'm, what I'm doing is I'm looking at quality of materials on the same building, which is a part of our standards. So I'm kind of like, okay, you chose Hardy Plank, and now you're going to court, and Hardy Plank comes with a guarantee. Can you show us what your warranty is? Well, show us that. Uh, Hardy Plank. Okay. Is that something you think you could provide? Your the warranty information. Uh, the warranty. Well, we'll have Tweedledee and Tweedledum here. If we could take down all of your requests for information, and rather than our try to shoot from the hip right now to advise you, just take down the questions right. to do what they we are, can to provide them. They are questions yep. of whether or not you can provide it. So I really aren't look, I'm not looking for anything more than a yes, no. Yeah, okay. okay. Could you provide us with the warranty information regarding Corton? Yes or no? We will, I mean, we'll ask, we will, um, Take down your questions to go back and get the information you ask. So that's a yes. You will I, provide that we. I don't know if we'll provide it. I don't know what the well, warranty if is. No warranty. Then that's providing me information. Right. So right. We, we will get you the answer. There is there is warranty yeah. information on the application of the material. Thank you. The and and you can provide that to us. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, now, um, in in the information that you provided us to, it does talk about. Um, regarding the material, is it applicable for your project? Did you have any conversation or can you show us any material that would say that you did discuss with Metal Tech USA whether or not this product is um, applicable for your project? And I think that would get to the whole heart of do you put this material in a seaside environment? I mean, I'm just wondering, do they address seaside salt? Um, can you bring us any information about any conversations you had with them about whether or not this product should be put onto this site. With the vendor. So, with, with the vendor, yes. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so that would cover that one. Okay. I noticed um, back in 2013 when we originally had a question in, in regards to um, exterior materials and there was a response saying the upper portion of the structure features shingles and hardy plank clapboards while the lower portion will be clad in a more durable steel siding material at least 24 gauge okay so that's what you responded to us when we wanted to know more and I see from your handout that it's a 22 gauge why did you not go with what you promised that you would do at least what was at least a 24 gauge? Why 20, did you? 22 not? gauge is thicker. Excuse me. It's 22 thicker. gauge is thicker than 24. Mm -hmm. 22 Gage, gauges go in the opposite direction. Ah, okay. Smaller is thicker, so we improved the 24. Okay, so it's thicker. so we kept our promise. <laughs> okay, so it is thicker. Thank you. I would not have known that. Okay. And as we look at quality of material, if there is any question that the board may have on whether or not this material will, is appropriate for its environment, 
do you know of any other product that would mimic, I think, what you really like about this product, uh, don't want to put words in your mouth, the color. I think when people are driving by, I don't think they're thinking of the gauge, of the thickness, of how much, I think they're saying, I like the color. If I'm wrong, you think I'm wrong that they don't like the color? What the residents who have written in say, they like the texture too. Well, I was just wondering, would you be able to tell us if there was another material that does mimic the color without, and it would not be a weatherizing steel? Is there another steel Copper. product? <laughs> no, that's a weatherizing product, wouldn't it be? Same color. No, is there another steel product out there that is not considered weatherizing steel that would mimic the same color and would show the texture? I mean, you wouldn't be able to tell one from the other. Right, there is bare steel that will also rust, but it does not protect the uh, steel behind it, so it's a much riskier product. No, I'm not looking for a weathering steel. Is there a steel product out there that would come coated in the same type of look, the color, the texture? I mean, if you put the two side by side, do you, are you aware of any products out there? There's a, there is a product called AZP, but it's, but it's actually painted. I mean, we can paint this any color we want. So AZ, AZP doesn't have the texture. It's, it's like speckled paint on top of um, siding. So that's the only one that kind of comes close to it, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a faux texture. OK. Can you provide us any specs on comparing Corton to a AZP? AZP? Well, it's the same as a painted steel. If Could you provide us any specs on Corton with? On a, on a painted steel siding versus Corten? Uh, Corten versus, you called it AZP? Did I get the letters right? It, it's, it's just how it's painted. Could it's you provide us with any, any material that would show them side by side or give a description or anything that's other than oral? Can you show us anything? One of the questions I would ask is I'm looking at the standard, which I think assume is the standard the board has, and um, whether the, st the standard is to do an alternatives analysis, with, which is, I, I think you're saying is, are there other things that are like it? I I'm just would ask the board to be mindful of their standard and their requests be within the standard. I am looking at quality. Um, you're using hardy plank for the rest of the building, and there are questions around whether Corten is of the same quality. Hardy plank would come with the guarantee. It, it, it's a different material. It won't corrode, for example. Correct? Hardy doesn't corrode? OK, and so I, I'm doing a side-by-side -side comparison of mm -hmm. quality of the material that's on the same building. And and I, I just need to get some more clarity. I mean, are we talking about durability and longevity when you speak of quality? I'm not sure what the um, quality, I think it's very open-ended. I'll read to you, if you'd like, from exterior materials, okay, shall be compatible with nearby buildings. So you're going to, in response to this request from another board member, you're going to bring in examples of compatibility with nearby buildings, correct? Yes. All right, so that's already covered. All right, no structure addition shall consist of architectural material inferior in quality, appearance, or detail to any other exterior of the same building. So I'm, I'm trying to do a comparison of the same building. So part of the building is clad in hardy plank, and the rest is corton. So I'm just trying to do a side by side because that's one of the standards, quality. And I'm hearing that there may be a question in regards to whether or not corton is appropriate for seaside environments. So is Hardy. I want to do it side by side. I'm just asking quality. Does Hardy come with a guarantee? Will Hardy corrode? Will, I'm just trying to do a side by side. Does that make sense now? Um, yeah. If anyone else can, <laughs> I mean, no, all right. That's what I'm just trying to do a side by side that the quality of the material is of the same, because that's right from here. It's not of an inferior in quality. So I'm looking at okay. corrosion. So we need to establish to make quality, however it's defined. OK. 
So, okay, you, you'll be able to do that. Okay, because I'd like to just move on and take that vote, but I also did have some questions about the product. And so you can do some research for us then and get back to us about this product in more detail than you're providing tonight, based on the questions I've asked. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Yes. One more question. We're, you're talking a lot about copper and comparability to copper based on color. But you're also emphasizing that Cortan has a unique texture. My familiarity with copper doesn't include anything other than a smooth texture. Is that, does copper also have a texture as it oxidizes other than high quality building copper? It seems to me that the texture of Cortan is something quite distinct. The fluted and the texture of Cortan is quite distinct from a weathered copper. It is. Both of them are distinctive. They're not exactly the same, no, but they're very similar. There's a, a, a different texture to Corten than there is on copper, but copper definitely has a visual texture and a very different sheen on the surface. It has a different sheen, but to me the two, in my mind, the two are not comparable. Perhaps you could bring us a a piece of weathered okay. copper and a piece of weathered Corten. One of my problems with the photographs okay. is I'm looking at the photograph you have of the Rudy's building and I drive past it many times a day in lots of different lights. I've never driven past it in a light where the color palette is like this picture. So I think it would be helpful if we actually had materials to look at because to me the pictures can be kind of deceptive rather than illuminating. Okay. Great, thank you. Okay, then anyone else have any comments or questions? Before we take our vote then? Okay, then we are voting on completeness. Would and, uh, anyone like to make a motion? Sure. Oh, I'm, I'm not sure if I heard sure or I do see Joe's hand up. Joe, did you want to make that motion? Sure. Thank you. Motion for the board to consider. Be it ordered that based on the plans and materials submitted and facts presented, the application of 517 Ocean House Road for amendments to the previously approved site plan and resource protection permit for Rudy's, an 80 seat restaurant, one apartment mixed use building, and phase two, 1,240 square foot retail building located at 517 Ocean House Road to change exterior siding, lighting, curbing, water lines, add a generator, and add raised planters be deemed complete. Do I hear um, is 517 the address for the addition, I mean for the phase two building as well? It's the only address we have for that lot okay. right now. Second. Thank you, Carolyn. Okay. Any discussion? And would I, all those in favor? And that is unanimous. Okay, it's deemed complete. Was I supposed to read be it further ordered? No, no it's a separate motion. Okay. Okay. All right. Now at this point, we're going to go um, open it up again to the public. If you wanted to make any further comments, this has been deemed complete. If you had any further comments that you wanted to make in regards to this project, you can certainly come up now and, and speak. Okay. Then I'm going to close that portion and I'm going to ask the board. I'm going to start in the same order that Pat started. Let's start with the lighting. So I'm going to get out my plans on the photometric on the lighting. For your plans of clarification, are you considering that we might go farther than a completeness finding? Um, yes, I was because my understanding was we can speak tonight. I, I guess my only question, Pat had specifically asked that we consider giving final approval from some oh. and I had a procedural question for Maureen on that. Okay. Um, I'm looking at the agenda and I'm, the question is have we given adequate public notice to do anything other than a completeness ruling tonight? The agenda refers only to completeness. This is true. 
So I, I think that while perhaps we could go further, I don't think we can do what you have requested us to do. As far as? Um, Actually giving final approval on a portion of what's been requested. Well, I know that, um, and I'm not sure about the procedural aspect, but I know that the board has the ability to waive a public hearing or not require a public hearing for portions of Public hearing, amount. yes. Notice, no. Okay. Okay, then I would like to... Yeah. Yep. Would it be helpful to have a sense of the meeting, a sense of the board, or is that even appropriate? How much you need to take away on all the Whatever information I, I think, the board is you know, willing to kind of Lane's point is right. If it hasn't been noticed, I don't think we can do it. But I think we, we could certainly communicate a sense of the board of satisfaction with those items and substance that would be confirmed eventually in a public hearing. Is that is that out of line by your thinking, Marie? Well, it's just if you are going to hold a public hearing, you might just want to wait until you hear whatever comments are made before you move towards a decision. Well, I think if Pat had some urgent need for this now, I, I'm not quite sure what the urgent need is, Pat. But uh, well, it was only just I, I thought that they were simple enough issues that perhaps the board could kind of rule on those tonight. Is, is all. It's we hear what you're saying about notice, but if uh, but may be helpful if there is any board member who has a concern about any of those five issues to let us know so that we can be prepared. And if you have no concerns, then that also provides us some sense. I would like to conduct this as we normally conduct this. We normally, and if I'll refer back to our 2013 meeting, we found it complete. We shared some issues, comments, questions. You go back and you make the changes. I mean, is that something no, that you'd be willing to listen to exactly, comments, sure. questions? I mean, that's, that's what we were prepared to do. Okay. Um, I was just trying to... Unfortunately, short, it sounds but, uh, like that we can't say um, yes. yes to these tonight. But, I mean, I would love to give you any comments, questions, that concerns be, that, that the board has nice. instead of making our public hearing last as long as this meeting looks like it's going to last. Maybe we can get rid of some of that tonight. That would be great. Is that okay? Okay. I want to talk about the lighting first of all then. Um, I appreciate that you did sh um, realize that one of the accent lights is not being shown. Um, on your photometric, I'm not sure if you have that with you, but if I could interrupt. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. I'd like to make a suggestion. Um, to the applicant that you've made changes to the photometric plan that the planning board doesn't have because they were submitted well after the deadline. I believe that your changes will address the concerns that have been raised. It might be more efficient for everyone's time if we just wait until the, that revised plan is gone to the board and then the board can ask questions. Because now you're going to be answering questions on the new plan that they don't have. Well, it's, can, can you just let me know if your new photometric sure. shows that the sign side number two is on a, um, a sign that is six feet tall instead of five feet tall? Does your photometric just say five or six now? I don't know what the photometric says, but I know that the sign has always been, since the original approval date, has been a six-foot sign. So Right, and your photometric uh, said five. So I'm just asking... That may have been an oversight on their part. Right. So I'm just saying that um, your photometric that I'll be looking at at the public hearing, I hope it says six feet tall instead okay. of five. You're right. It's probably just somebody's typo. So I'm just pointing that out to you. That no, we, haven't, we haven't changed the size or design of the sign at all yep. since it was originally approved. Whoever put the photometric together possibly just typed in the number five instead of number six. I'm not okay. saying that you change the site, uh, that sign height. I'm just saying in your photometric, the number five feet is there instead of six feet. Okay. Well, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll clarify that. Yeah. No big deal, right? No. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Does anyone else have any quick, easy answer or question, comment on the, on the lighting? Okay. Um, 
I don't have any questions on curbing. Um, actually, I think um, AMAC said it very nicely about how this is actually a superior material that you're going with uh, as far as the water line. I was actually hoping to hear from AMAC if I believe you mentioned it in your presentation that AMAC did not weigh in on the water line. So I would actually say to staff that I'm hoping that AMAC will weigh in because I do rely upon their expertise. I think, you know, if I can um, reiterate what Steve Harding and I discussed the other day, um, he indicated to me that he had been asked to kind of weigh in on the water line and that uh, he was unsure whether he really had jurisdiction over that or not. But he, his comment to me was that as long as the water district is, has approved the line, he's happy with it. So that was, okay. that's what he told me. And um, I haven't seen anything in writing, as I mentioned earlier. So, but I would expect that if he's been asked to provide information to the board, he'll do that. Right. It, it was more of a comment for staff as I go through right. this. Um, as far as the generator goes, um, I also read the letter from Bodwell. And Bodwell um, asked that to help bring the, the sound into the right um, readings that um, you should have a wood fence, which you're doing, two inches thick, which you're doing. Uh, base should be in the ground, as you're doing. Should be no gaps, just as you are doing. And should have a sound barrier. All the things that they recommend, all the things that I saw on the plan. Yes, so that's it's, correct. Right, so it's very good. Um, at the very bottom, they said to verify performance of the sound barrier fence, uh, Bodwell recommends additional sound propagation calculations using a terrain-based sound model. Would, uh, that's their recommendation. Is that's this their recommendation. That's not our recommendation. Mm -hmm. And I would hope that the board would um, understand that with, uh, with these measures that we're making, um, that clearly we're trying as hard as we can to kind of um, attenuate the sound and, um, and that we're comfortable that we're, we will be, we will meet or um, be at the sound levels at the property lines that we're required to. Um, so. the, other, the other issue, I mean, the other comment from Maureen was that uh, perhaps uh, there could be a note on the plan or a condition that says that we can only run the generator at full capacity during power outages. So, okay. again, okay. you know, the, the noise ordinance was not designed to accommodate generators. There's not, we, we looked, we tried to find a generator that was, that was less noisy. This generator is about as quiet as you can get, and um, it still exceeds on, on, uh, on, uh, on a regular basis, it exceeds the, the minimum sound standards. Um, and that's because they're, they're by nature, they're pretty noisy. And, um, you know, there are hundreds of these all over town. And um, unfortunately, we're in a situation where we have a site plan review and we have to meet that standard. But um, my recommendation to, to Maureen was that the, the standard really should be modified to exclude generators because clearly they're used during emergency purposes. At that point in time, nobody's really concerned, that concerned about, uh, about trying to get some sleep. They're really concerned about trying to stay warm. Right. Um, we can probably add that to other things that the planning board is looking into. Okay. I just wanted to bring that up because it was one of their recommendations. Mm -hmm. So, okay. Um, that was it. And you've already heard uh, my comments and questions about deciding. Does anyone else have anything that they just want to comment, question, discuss before Elaine? Go ahead. I'd like to go back to the neighbor's concern about the um, drainage onto the property and the sand that's now draining and whether the change in the curbing will have any impact and whether the curbing will in fact keep sand, grit, whatever from draining back onto that back property. Yes. Um, I should, I should note that the grading for the project as it's currently being constructed is the same grading that was approved you right. know, two years ago. So right. we haven't adjusted the grading at all. All we've done is changed the material of the curving itself. But if I can, unfortunately, I have plans to show you. There is a curve that runs all the way along the property. All of this water, every bit of water on the site, 
drains at this point right here. So all of this drains down, comes down through here, and the green garden, and this just goes back into the water. So um, we're comfortable that the grading, as it's currently designed and as it's being constructed today, um, is not going to impact. In fact, it's going to probably help his situation because there's, there previously was water that probably went in that direction from, from the old Rudy's. So you're saying the sand that's gone on to that site during construction would be less of a problem once you finish your final grade? Yes, what, what's happened is that the sand, there's, there's There is a creation in here. This grade was actually brought up as the vapor indicator approximately two feet. And uh, during construction, I mean, that area hasn't been paved. Well, of course, it has been now, but previously it hadn't been paved. This edge uh, has not been finished off because we're waiting for the curbing. Uh, once that curbing goes in, that edge will be finished off. And there's actually, if you look on the landscape plan, there's quite a bit of landscaping it actually goes in along that whole boundary line here, along that five feet. That's uh, all landscaped as, um, as a buffer to the neighbor. So once that goes in, it'll all be, the curbing goes in, it'll all be loamed, it'll be planted, and then mulched in that area. So um, there should not be any erosion or sand that's extending off the property line. That and the change of type of curbing that you're projecting or you're requesting wouldn't impact that? No, because the profiles are exactly the same. If you look at the profiles for the slip form curbing in that area, it's a, it's a Cape Cod type curbing. Um, it's exactly the same as the bituminous curbing that was originally approved. Okay, thank you. Any other and if I could also, um, I know he had an issue about, or brought up an issue about lighting. Yes. Um, again, the lighting that we've selected is it's a very high performance, sharp cutoff type light. And um, the lighting these days is really, really very well engineered. Um, you're, ve you're very much able to kind of direct light exactly where you want it to go and block it where you don't want it to go. And as the photometrics plan illustrates, um, we're well below any kind of light spill off the property as far as um, meeting the town standards. So I think at the, at the highest point, it's, um, it's somewhere right about in here, and it's 0.4 foot candles at the property line. Now the, the town standard is 0.5, so we're below that. Everywhere else, it's significantly less than that. Um, so. I, I don't think, and especially if his tenants are up on the second floor, they're clearly not going to see any glare from these, uh, from these uh, light fixtures because they're all shining. Like I say, they're sharp cut off. They're shined, shined directly down. You don't see the glare from the lights uh, like you used to. So we feel very confident that this will be a very high performing, um, accurate uh, light, sh light display out there. There'll be a glow. I mean, that, there's no doubt that there'll be a glow from the property where it's light, but you're not going to get any glare and you're not going to get any real spill of light onto the property. And will there be at some point in the day when those lights will be turned off or are they basically 24 hour or all throughout the dark periods for security reasons? Um, I think some of those will probably be on for, for security reasons, um, but probably not all of them. And. Um, that's pretty typical, I think, in most business situations. Anyone else have any more questions for um, Mr. Carroll? No, sir. Okay. The link covered them all. Great. Is that down here? I actually, a couple of questions I have about actually the sketch, if I could talk to you, Mr. Calvin. So um, I can't see it from here, but. Um, uh, have, are those new or are those th what was originally presented? Those, the original? Pre okay, so yeah, I was going to say they were hard for me to read. Um, I was wondering if you could present um, new sketches that you turn off the shading? Absolutely. Okay, and as far as the labels go, um, I noticed that the roof is white, the hardy plank is white, the cordon is white, and your key down there has different colors. 
if maybe you could match your key to your buildings. You see the picture up in the upper? Yes, that's the key. That's the key. And then see the picture in the upper uh, left hand? Yes. If the shading wasn't on, that picture is entirely white. Okay, we'll clarify. Okay, that would help. Okay. Color's always nice. Yep, we do have an actual building in color too, so photos of that. Um, no, I'd rather just. More helpful. Not just photos. I don't want a photo. I, I want actually. I'd like to have rendered elevations without yes, shading. Yes, exactly. Okay. I want this with the uh, shading turned off, and I want the key applied. Otherwise, if you don't have the shading, most of your building, except for some roofing material, it's all white. Yep, absolutely. Okay. So, key will match the elevation. All right. Um, now, on the side, was it? Lower right hand? West elevation. West elevation, yes. thank you. The pitch right there? Yes. The triangle at the top? Is that labeled of what material it is? Is there a label saying this is? It currently is not, but we will add a label. Okay, so it's not labeled. I just didn't know what material it is. So that will be labeled. Yes, okay. it is the, the hardy as well, but we will label it. Do you um, normally put all your accent lightings on an elevation, or is lighting not something you put on your elevation sketches? Yeah, sometimes we do and sometimes we don't. Sometimes that's decided independently. Are you at so. the point where you feel that you could put those lights? We could add lighting. We could get that overall look? Mm -hmm. Okay, just wondering. Um, I think that might be. Oh, is, as far as all the um, hardy material, um, sometimes I saw hardy board, hardy batten. I, I'm not familiar with all these terms. Um, is hardy board, hardy batten, are, are they the same thing as hardy trim boards? I mean, is there a standard language? Because if you're they're going all, back and forth, I, I, I don't follow it. Yeah, they're all the same material, but they have different thicknesses and different sizes. And I can bring in some uh, uh, different examples if that would be helpful. Okay, because I think on your key, I think one time you say hardy board, and then I look for hardy board, and I found hardy uh, batten. So I don't know. Are you talking sure. the same material? They're all three different things. A board is different than a batten is different than a panel. A panel is a 4 by 8 or 4 by 10 sheet. Um, a board is actually 5 inches to the weather that's more like a clapboard. And a batten is actually about three quarters of an inch thick by about an inch and a half wide. So, so they're all actually different. So then I was wondering if your key could match exactly what you're presenting to us. Because like I said, I found the word hardy board and then I went looking for it and I found hardy batten. So I just want to make sure your key is exactly matching up to your sketches. Okay, we can do that. Okay. Those are, I think that was it as far as, I, I just want to be able to make sure this sketch is accurate. Anyone have any questions about the sketch? No? Okay. Then at this point, would anyone like to make a motion? Carol Ann. Be tabled. We're missing a word. In our, sorry. Be tabled to the November 18, 2014 meeting of the planning board, at which time a public hearing will be held. Second. Thank you, Elaine. Any discussion Thank on the motion? You. Seeing none. All those in favor? That is unanimous. So the motion is passed. Thank you. 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 Yeah. Well, is, is it too late now? Can we open this up? Or is it too late? You can. You can decide if you want to schedule a site visit. Okay. Thank you. Does anyone want to do a site visit? No, I would I like, like to see the court in up close and personal. It doesn't require a site visit. But you okay if you just walk on and stop the website?
you're, we're going to have to work something out because you can't have direct conversations right. with the applicant. No, no, I understand. But uh, I mean, I have stopped off and the, app and, the applicant and, has okay. said they do not want anyone on the property without prior notice. Okay. Well, other board members don't care about a site visit, I think. Then do you want to do a site? Let's do a site walk. I would like to see that. I've never actually been in. I would like to see that stuff. Up close. Yeah. So you want to do something during the week? What are people thinking of? You know, the beginning of the work day, or do you want to go for a weekend? Yeah. Whatever. Yeah. During the week. During the week early. Early. Once it's light enough to see it. You want to do something this week, next back. week? Next this week. Next week. It's not supposed to start raining until Saturday. I think the weather's going to be a lot better. Right. Okay, do we want to try like uh, the 28th? Is it Tuesday? No. No? Wednesday <laughs> is the 29th? Wednesday. 30th? 30th is Thursday? I have an appointment already at 8 o'clock on Thursday, the 30th. 31st, Halloween. Can we stay out for? These days weren't working? Tuesday, Wednesday weren't working? Tuesday, Wednesday. Was it Wednesday? Wednesday. 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 Oh, okay. Wednesday the 29th. Okay. Mm -hmm. What time do you want to do it? Early. What's early for you? Two. Don't go crazy. I'm <laughs> sun up. Seven. <laughs> Not that early. Not far away. Seven thirty. What do other people want to do? Seven or seven thirty? Seven thirty. Seven thirty. Do we hear seven thirty? I'm hearing. Until about quarter seven now, really. You're right. Pretty dark. We want the light to be good. Yeah, that's more than yeah. important. The light's good at seven thirty. Is it good? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's, it's two. Two. I'm outside before seven and. Yeah, you can see things then. Yeah, 730, 7.30 is, it might be a little cold, but 7.30. It might 7 be a few minutes, but I don't think they're good on site. The light isn't good at that time. <laughs> it's certainly, it's certainly it, my kid's out at the bus stop. It's fine. It's, 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 she's not standing in the dark. It's very bright at 7.30. Okay. So Wednesday, the 29th at 7.30 a.m., and we will meet at 517 Ocean House Road. Okay. All right, then. That work for you, Pat? Park right here? on the street. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great then. Well, we'll have a site walk next. Okay. Thank you. Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. Thank you. We're uh, adjourned. Thank you. <laughs>